I remember swiping right on her profile like it was yesterday. The bright screen of my phone illuminated her picture, casting a ghostly glow in my dark room. Her name was Bella, 23 years old. She had an enigmatic smile, one that seemed familiar, yet I couldn't place where I had seen it before. Bella was the epitome of ethereal beauty, a mesmerizing blend of grace and allure. Her eyes were the most striking feature, large and expressive, shimmering like pools of water under the silver moon. They held a depth that seemed almost otherworldly, captivating anyone who dared meet her gaze. Her long hair cascaded down her shoulders in luscious waves, the color of midnight, a stark contrast to her fair porcelain skin. It framed her face perfectly, highlighting her high cheekbones and the delicate curve of her jawline. Her thin lips were curled into a subtle, enigmatic smile, her figure slender and tall. Every aspect of her appearance was harmonious, creating an aura of elegance and an undeniable magnetic pull that was impossible to ignore. Her bio was intriguing, but vague. Just a quote from a famous poet. She was really into true crime documentaries, preferred to Netflix and chill, and had a thing for good food. I felt drawn to her, somehow wondering if I have come across her before. After a few exchanges of witty banter and flirtatious remarks, we agreed to meet at a local bar. I had never been there before, but the name sounded oddly familiar. As I approached the bar, a strange sensation washed over me. The neon sign flickered, casting a surreal light on the pavement. It felt like I was walking into a scene from a movie that I had seen long ago, a sense of deja vu that I couldn't shake off. The bar was dimly lit, with old jazz music playing in the background and a familiar scent of bourbons and cigars lingered in the air. The atmosphere was intimate, almost too perfect. She was already there, seated at a corner table, her eyes reflecting the dim lights. As our eyes met, a shiver ran down my spine. She was even more captivating in person, her presence both alluring and somehow unsettling. We hit it off immediately. Conversation flowed effortlessly, as if we had known each other for years. Her laughter was infectious, and her stories were fascinating, yet they tinged with an eerie familiarity. She spoke of places she had visited, books she had read, and her love for old horror films, many of which were my favorites too. As the night progressed, she made casual remarks that sent jolts of recognition through me. She mentioned a book I was currently reading as if she knew it was on my nightstand. She referenced a horrific dream, exactly like the one I had a week ago, a chilling nightmare that I hadn't shared with anyone. Each coincidence was more bizarre than the last, blurring the lines between reality and something otherworldly. When I finally gathered the courage to ask her about these strange coincidences, she was quick to brush off my question with a smile. But then she dropped a tantalizing prospect. She invited me to her place. By then, the drinks had clouded my judgment, and her sheer allure was irresistible. I agreed, but I could not have fully understood the gravity of my inebriated decision. The drive to her place was a blur. The streets were empty and the night seemed unusually still, as if the world was holding its breath. But when we arrived at her apartment, a chilling realization dawned upon me. I had been there before. The layout, the particular painting on the wall, the shaman rugs with weird symbols, even the way the door creaked as it opened, it was all too familiar. She was quick to lead me to her bedroom and close the door behind her. She leaned in to kiss me on my cheek before excusing herself to fill us some wine. But as soon as I was there and saw a particular book on the top of her desk, I froze. Dark magic of the Amazons. And in that moment, the deja vu, the dreams, the nightmares, they all made perfect sense. My memories flooded back in fragments, disjointed and hazy. I remembered swiping right on her profile, but that was not yesterday. It was the day before. 
The same bar, the same conversations, the same eerie coincidences. I had lived this very night the previous day as well. But there was something more, something sinister that I had forgotten. My heart raced as I recalled the chilling discovery from the previous night that I had spent at that place. I had seen her slip something into my drink, an act overshadowed by the horrifying sight that followed. In her kitchen, amidst the normalcy of utensils and herbs and Indian spices, lay a collection of knives like one I had never seen before. It made sense to me later that they were not meant for cooking, but for something more gruesome. And then, I had come across the bones in her trash, human-like, scattered carelessly, which she had nonchalantly explained were for her dog. Whatever she had spilled into the drink last night was slow to take effect, because in that moment, I recalled saying to myself, there's no dog in this apartment. Panic had surged through me as the truth dawned. She wasn't just a strange woman from Tinder, she was dangerous. I had grabbed a knife from her kitchen, and naturally, when she came at me later with a meat cleaver, she was surprised to find me stabbing her heart. I had acted in self-defense. Before I could even think what I had done, I was quick to dump her body in the bathtub. I had fled, the horror of that night haunting me. But as these memories resurfaced, reality twisted into a nightmare. If she was dead, then who was the woman standing before me with two wine glasses? I excused myself to the bathroom, hoping to make sense of the chaos. The bathroom was exactly as I remembered from the previous night. Cold, sterile, and immaculate, except for the overbearing stench. And then there she was, in the bathtub, lifeless, just as I had left her body. The room spun around me, my mind struggling to comprehend the impossible. If she was dead, who was the girl outside? Returning to the living room, I was met with the most terrifying sight of my life. The woman, the one that I had been with all night, stood there, but she was different. Her eyes were pitch black, voids of darkness that seemed to consume the light around her. Her skin was unnaturally pale, and the wound in her chest, the one that I had inflicted, was a grotesque testament to her death. In that moment, the horrific truth became clear. I had been on a date with a ghost, the vengeful spirit of the cannibalistic woman I had murdered the previous night. She had orchestrated this nightmarish repeat of our last encounter, a macabre replay leading to her ultimate revenge. As she lunged at me, her teeth transformed into scissor-like blades, a twisted smile on her ghostly face. I stumbled backward, terror gripping my heart. The world around me faded into darkness soon as fountains of blood gushed through my neck, and as life started escaping my body, I felt her cold, purple lips kissing my cheek for one last time. We've exiled him now. He will never be allowed back. Not after it. It was extremely late at night. My parents were out and I was left alone in the house. For the past couple of weeks, my uncle had been staying around for the winter holiday. My parents quite liked him because they found him funny, but I despised him. Every day he would always give me this horrid stare. It started off in the direction of my face, but the longer he stared, the further down my body he would look. Disgusting. When I had tried to tell my parents about it, they simply laughed and said, he's probably just joking or something. He left one morning without anyone seeing him go. He left a message saying he had to rush out somewhere. I can't recall where. As I was lying in bed watching Netflix, I shivered even thinking about him. Suddenly, a notification rang out from my phone. I grabbed it. It was a snap ad request. Immediately, I was distracted as I hit accept and waited for the guy who had added me to respond. Hey, X, the message read. I giggled and replied, Hey, XX. There was a pause for a moment as his bitmoji waited on the screen, staring at me. I typed, 
You look really sexy. I gasped. I was a little surprised, to say the least, until I thought about the fact this guy hadn't seen me. I hadn't even sent a snap yet. Thanks, ha ha. How do you know? He didn't reply. His bitmoji vanished, and I was left sat in chat, alone. I put the phone down, and for a moment, I thought it was just another guy wanting to play with my feelings, like always. My eyebrows lifted as another snap came through. It was from him again, though this time, it was a snap. Excitedly, I opened it. My entire stomach fell flat with dread. I was looking at a picture of me, in bed, staring at my phone. I couldn't move. The flash came from my wardrobe. Who's there? No reply. Dad? Mom? The wardrobe door slowly began to creak open. I saw the glint of a face emerging from the darkness. My uncle stared at me. His mouth widened into a thick and revolting grin. Hello, Jane. Carefully, he crawled out of the wardrobe, stretching as he placed each foot one by one onto the floor. He let the phone drop to the floor. I've been so patient. I stared at him, my eyes filled with terror. I quivered and shrank back, slinking to the other side of the bed as I tried to distance myself from him. Under the covers, I held my phone. I began recording a voice message. You're a creep! He cackled and shifted about in place. Oh, how excited you make me. How excited you've always made me. His laugh came to an abrupt halt as his face dropped in its expression. He looked at me hungrily. I felt tears begin to well in my eyes as I reached the end of the bed. I had to stand up. As I left the safety net of my covers, I swept back until my spine touched the wall. He smirked. Where do you go now, Jane? He began reaching into his pocket. Don't! I shrieked. He ignored me and continued to stare as he inched towards the bed. Soon enough, he reached it and clambered on top, moving slowly, carefully as if to not disturb me. His hand stayed in his pocket locked in, waiting. Two days, Jane. I've been waiting two days in that bloody wardrobe. But I did it for you. Can't you see that? My skin rippled with fear as I imagined him watching me sleep those two nights. Watching me change. Vile. Get away! I screamed at him as he climbed down from the bed. He stood in front of me. For a moment, he said nothing only staring at me as I shrank down onto the floor, petrified. Suddenly, something snapped in him. Don't you dare speak to me like that, little girl! He grabbed me by the arm and hauled me upwards. He then threw me to the ground and cackled as I tried squirming away. He loved it. I almost made it to my feet when he stomped on my back, pushing me down against the floor. Now, Jane, let me show you why you should have stayed silent. Wretched little... The noise of the door opening downstairs cut him off. Both of us swiveled our heads to my bedroom door. Immediately, I screamed with all the capacity of my lungs, wailing for my parents to come and help. In an instant, the sound of footsteps came stampeding up the stairs. A tear drooled from my eye. I was saved. I was silenced soon after with a sharp kick to the head. I woke up what felt like hours later. My parents had asked me what had happened, why I was lying on the floor unconscious, and why the window had a gaping hole in it. I leapt into their arms and grabbed my phone. The voice message had recorded everything. As I showed it to them, my mom fled out of the room, tears draining from her eyes as she vomited in the bathroom. My dad, on the other hand, visibly enraged, sprinted to grab the landline. The police arrived around 30 minutes later. My parents showed them the voice message, the smashed window, and the quivering child, me. They then went through and asked each and every one of the family if they had seen my uncle. None of them knew where he was. To this day, we don't. He vanished the morning he originally left. 
Since then, I have forever remained damaged. I don't trust any man in my family other than my father, and my wardrobe has been demolished and removed from my room. Yet every night, I check everywhere. Who knows? I might be hiding again. The moment I stepped back into my hometown, the air felt different, heavier, as if saturated with unspoken accusations and fear. My name is John, once just a common name, which had now become a synonym for something dark and sinister. Growing up, I was the nicest guy one could meet, and then one day, I had joined the league of people like Ted Bundy and Ed Kemper. Netflix even did a popular true crime series about me some time back. I hadn't seen it, but I was told it became really popular. People on the streets in my hometown glanced my way with a mix of curiosity and fear. Mothers pulled their children close, and whispers followed me like a shadow. The weight of my past was a tangible force pressing down on me. I found myself drawn to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. The place was a decaying husk of its former self. The vibrant colors had faded, and the laughter that once filled the air was now just an echo in my mind. Shattered windows covered in dust and grime stared back at me like hollow eyes. The walls were canvases for strange graffiti, symbols that seemed to hold some dark meaning I couldn't decipher. Pushing open the door, a chorus of creaks and groans greeted me, as if the building itself was lamenting its fate. The inside was a time capsule, a snapshot of the day my life changed forever. The sight of the main stage brought a rush of memories, each one a sharp jab to my heart. It was there, in the spotlight of joy and innocence, that a child's life had been tragically cut short, and I was there. I sat on the edge of the stage, the silence around me oppressive. The dust in the air danced in the slivers of light piercing through the broken windows. In that solitude, a tear escaped, a silent testament to the injustice to the years stolen from me and the innocent life lost. Exploring the pizzeria was like navigating through a haunted maze. Each corner held shadows of laughter and screams, each room a story untold. The animatronics, once the stars of the show, now stood as grotesque sentinels, their peeling paint and lifeless eyes a mockery of their former glory. The silence was unnerving, filled with the whispers of a past that refused to die. In the depths of the security office, amidst a clutter of forgotten items, I found them. Old newspaper clippings, police reports, a dossier of the nightmare that enveloped my life. As I sifted through them, a horrifying picture began to emerge. The pieces of the puzzle were fitting together, revealing a truth more chilling than I had ever imagined. There were inconsistencies, unexplained phenomena, witnesses speaking of shadows and eerie voices. It wasn't just a murder. It was something beyond the realm of the living. But of course, no one believed. As darkness enveloped the pizzeria, its haunted nature became more pronounced. Lights flickered as if struggling to maintain their grip on reality. The whispers grew louder, a cacophony of voices that seemed to emanate from the walls, the ceiling, and the very air I breathed. And then I saw it. The animatronics seemed to twitch and move in the periphery of my vision. It was impossible. The place had been closed for decades. I had wondered if whatever sinister was at play that night would still be around. It seems like it never left. Then came the voice. A sinister whisper that cut through the chaos, as it said, John the Ripper. The nickname, a cruel reminder of the false identity forced upon me, echoed through the halls. The next moment, I was seeing visions play out before my eyes. The screams from that fateful day, the stampede in the crowd, short circuits and fires, and then the body of a child lying at my feet on the main stage. And that is when I saw an animatronic of Freddy Fazbear come to life before my eyes. Welcome back, John. It said, here for round two. I stood in the heart of the pizzeria, a man wronged by both the living and the dead. 
I steeled myself for the confrontation that lay ahead. Freddy leapt after me, its old rusty parts groaning, his red eyes flickering. It scared me a decade ago as well when I worked there, but now it was straight out of a nightmare. It had caught me off guard back then, framed me for the murder of the child, but it didn't know that this time I came prepared. I pulled out a powder from my pocket and hurled it ahead like a snowball. Freddy stopped in its tracks, paralyzed. In prison, amidst the despair and desolation, I had found an unlikely mentor, a Mexican bunkmate who had whispered to me ancient rituals and chants, tools to communicate, and, if need be, combat the dead. The pizzeria, now a battleground, echoed with the sinister laughter of the spirit. It was enjoying the challenge. All the other animatronics stirred to life as well, their movements jerky and unnatural. As they advanced towards me, their metal limbs creaking and whirring, I remembered the words of my bunkmate, the incantations he had taught me. My voice, steady despite the terror, filled the air with ancient chants, a language forgotten by time but remembered by the dead. The chase was a nightmare brought to life. I weaved through the maze of tables and games, the animatronics and restless pursuit. Their once joyful expressions were now twisted into ghastly sneers. I lured the animatronics to the main stage, the heart of the pizzeria, and the epicenter of my sorrow. My time in prison had not just been spent on learning chants, I had also picked up a thing or two about electricity. In the days leading to this night, I had rigged the pizzeria's electrical system, turning the stage into a trap. The showdown was tense, a dance with death itself. The animatronics, their movements erratic and violent, closed in on me, but I stood my ground, chanting louder, my voice echoing through the hollow shell of the pizzeria. With a final incantation and a surge of electricity, the trap was sprung. Brilliant arcs of electricity danced around the stage, catching the animatronics in a web of high voltage. Their movements became spasmodic, then ceased altogether as the power overwhelmed them. In that electric light, the spirit finally materialized, its form a swirling vortex of shadows. It screamed in rage and pain, the sound a chilling symphony of the tormented souls it had ensnared. But the chance and the electrical trap were too much. With a final ear-splitting wail, the spirit dissipated, its presence evaporating like mist in the morning sun. The animatronics collapsed, their lifeless forms now just hollow shells of metal and wires. The dark atmosphere lifted replaced by a profound silence. I felt the weight of a decade's burden lift from my shoulders, a freedom that was both physical and spiritual. As I turned to leave, a faint apparition appeared before me. It was the child, the victim of the spirit's evil game. He looked at me, a smile gracing his ethereal face, a silent acknowledgement of the truth finally revealed. And then, like a whisper on the wind, he vanished. Stepping out of Freddy Fazbear's pizzeria, the night air felt different, lighter. The stars above shone a little brighter, a silent testament to the justice reclaimed. I walked away from the pizzeria, my steps unburdened, a man freed from the chains of an unjust past and a haunting present. The night embraced me, not as the Ripper, but as John, a man finally at peace. The day was shrouded in a cloak of melancholy as I steered my six-year-old son through the doors of Chuck E. Cheese. Even though it was just two blocks down from my place, this was the first time I was visiting it in almost a year. It was a deliberate choice, marking one year since the universe cruelly snatched my husband, Anthony, from us. He had worked at this very outlet, a job he took up after abruptly quitting his position at a funeral home. Anthony had been a changed man after an incident involving the embalming of a dead priest. It had changed this cheerful, lovely man to a secretive, paranoid human in a matter of days. Whatever had transpired during that time, he took its secrets to the grave. His tenure at Chuck E. Cheese was tragically short. One fateful night, 
as he worked the late shift, a grotesque accident with a malfunctioning Chucky animatronic claimed his life. Now, a year later, returning to this place felt like a silent homage to him, a bridge to the brief memories my son held of his father. The visit started innocuously enough, with my son's laughter echoing through the arcade. He darted from game to game, his face alight with joy, occasionally pausing to munch down slices of pizza. I watched him, each of his giggles a bittersweet symphony that filled the air around me. I saw reflections of Anthony in him, in his smiles, his excitement, the way his eyes sparkled with each new discovery. It felt like a living memory, a piece of Anthony still vibrant and alive in our son. But in an instant, that warmth turned to ice. I looked away for a mere moment, lost in my reverie, and when my gaze returned to where my son had been playing, he was gone. Panic clawed at my throat as I called out his name. My voice lost amidst the cacophony of games and children's shouts. Desperation drove my steps as I wove through the crowd, my eyes searching frantically for any sign of him. The Chuck E. Cheese staff, noticing my distress, quickly rallied to assist. They were kind, their faces etched with concern, but the growing fear in my heart overshadowed their reassurances. Evan, a staff member, helped me. We scoured the place, our search turning more frantic with each passing minute. The staff made repeated announcements over the PA system, and some empathetic patrons joined our search, their eyes mirroring my worry. Even the CCTV footage was scrutinized by Evan, but it offered no clues. My son had simply disappeared within the walls of Chuck E. Cheese. As the place began to empty, the atmosphere thickened with an eerie quiet. It was then, in the dimming light and the fading echoes of the day's joy, that Evan made a chilling observation. There were five animatronics, a mainstay of Chuck E. Cheese, at that outlet. But when Evan counted, he came up one short. One of the life-size Chuck E. figures was missing. Our search became more targeted, leading us behind the scenes to the staff-only areas where remnants of joy gave way to silent corridors and locked doors. And then, breaking the stillness, we heard it. The unmistakable sound of my son's laughter. It was coming from behind one of the locked doors. We called out to him, our voices tinged with both relief and fear. He didn't respond. The laughter continued, haunting sound that seemed out of place in the deserted back rooms. Evan, sensing the urgency, shouldered the door open with a forceful push. As the door swung open with a resounding crash, we stepped into a scene that was as surreal as it was chilling. There, in the middle of the room, sat my son. He was cross-legged on the floor, his back to us, engaged in what seemed like a conversation with an animatronic Chuck E. Cheese. The room was unlike any other part of the establishment. It was smaller, almost claustrophobic, with walls adorned with pagan symbols and cryptic drawings. Candles flickered in the dim light, casting eerie shadows that danced across the walls. The air was heavy, saturated with a sense of foreboding that made me shudder. Honey? I called out tentatively, my voice a mix of relief and dread. My son turned his face, lighting up upon seeing me. But there was a strangeness in his eyes that I couldn't place. Mommy! Daddy was talking to me through Chucky! He exclaimed, pointing at the animatronic figure. His words sent a cold shiver down my spine. Anthony? Speaking through an animatronic? The animatronic itself was unnervingly still, its painted eyes staring blankly ahead. It was a grotesque parody of the cheerful mascot, its presence in the macabre setting a twisted mockery. As I moved to pick up my son, the animatronic's head suddenly turned to face me. Its mechanical voice, unnaturally cheerful, rang out. Hi, Susan. You look gorgeous as ever. My throat, my heart pounding in my chest. This was impossible, yet the familiar use of my name, the tone, it was unmistakably Anthony's, but how could that be? The animatronic, now animated with a life of its own, 
began to speak in Anthony's voice. It told a tale that was as heartbreaking as it was horrifying. Anthony had been haunted by the spirit of the dead priest he had embalmed, driven to set up this secret room for communing with the spirit. But the spirit had been malevolent, seeking a way to break free, leading to the tragic accident that took Anthony's life. Now, as a spirit himself, Anthony had found a way to communicate through the animatronic, waiting a year to speak to our son. The revelation was overwhelming, and I found myself drawn into a conversation with my husband's spirit. He spoke of a ritual, a way for him to come back to life. My heart ached with longing and hope. Evan protested, warning of the dangers of meddling with such forces, but I was too consumed by grief and the desire to have Anthony back. But then, a chilling moment shattered the illusion. During our conversation, the animatronic, supposedly channeling Anthony, failed to recall the name of our pet dog, a detail Anthony would never forget. It was then I realized the horrifying truth. It wasn't Anthony's spirit, but the malevolent priest impersonating him. Panic set in as we realized the danger we were in. We turned to flee, but the animatronic lurched to life, chasing us with jerky, unnatural movements. My son clung to me, his cries piercing the tense air as we dashed through the maze-like back corridors of Chuck E. Cheese. The chase was nightmarish, the animatronic's mechanical laughter echoing through the halls as we ran. In a horrifying turn, Evan was injured, leaving me to navigate the twisting corridors with my son in tow. Soon, the evil Chucky had cornered me and my son. I swear to God, I had almost given up then. All I wanted was for my son to be safe. That's when I saw a reflection in a piece of glass. It was Anthony's spirit. It was a fleeting image, but it gave me a sliver of hope. His spirit guided an ax to fall beside me, and with a surge of adrenaline, I picked it up and swung it with all my might once and again and again, severing the animatronic Chucky into pieces. Grabbing my son, we rushed out of the building, the angry howls of the priest spirit echoing behind us as the lights flickered wildly. We escaped into the night, the horrors of Chuck E. Cheese behind us, but the memory of that night would haunt us forever. How do you feel when you walk alone at night? Are you overly cautious? Do you walk in fear, looking back every few seconds thinking that something will happen to you at any moment? Or are you one of those people who feel safe and think that dangerous things only happen to a few people who make the news? My name is Jake, and I used to be one of those people. I mean, I'm a man, I'm an adult, and I'm over six feet tall. I'm the kind of guy you wouldn't want to pick a fight with. But that night, none of that mattered. That night, I realized that no matter who you are, if you're looking for misfortune, it'll find you. I used to work at night at a boring office job that is not even worth mentioning. When it was time to go home, I had to rush to the station to catch the last train. If I didn't catch it, I had to walk several blocks in the dark. To be honest, I chose the schedule because I was paid for night hours. I never thought I would be in danger just walking at night. At worst, I'd run. And that's exactly what happened the night it all happened. It was a Tuesday night. This was known to be the dullest and least busy day of the week. But this Tuesday was an exception. My department was the only one that had received extra work. And to make it worse, I was the one who had to make sure everything was in order and close the office. When I left, the few remaining colleagues and I went our separate ways. Everyone had a car except me. But since we lived so far away from each other, no one could give me a ride. I knew I would surely not make the train, but I still thought I might get lucky, so I hurried and ran. When I arrived at the station, I noticed that the ticket seller was not there, which didn't surprise me. Almost nobody pays for a train ticket, and the entrances are open at this hour. Agitated, I checked the electronic signs to see when the train would arrive, but as usual, they weren't working either. I could only wait on the platform and see if the train would show up in the next few minutes. I sat low, illuminated by the dim moonlight waiting for the train. I didn't think it would arrive. Normally, a few people would have already come to wait for it with me. 
I looked across the station just to confirm that no one was coming, but to my surprise, I saw a silhouette in the distance. Another person was coming. I remember thinking that maybe the train was just delayed, but it was coming. But with each step the other person took, I began to notice something strange. Admittedly, I couldn't see far away without my glasses, but there was something about the silhouette that didn't fit. What? When I could see what was ahead of me, I swear my blood froze. That wasn't a man like me coming back from work. It was a man with a sheet covering half of his body. The sheets were dirty, and his pants looked like they were torn. Was he homeless? As I analyzed him, I noticed something else, and maybe this was what I must have seen from the beginning. Although it was only about two meters away, the man was not walking in the direction of the end of the train station. He was walking in the direction of me. At that moment, I thought for sure he was paranoid, that this could not be more than a coincidence, but I didn't want to take any risks. I grabbed my backpack from the seat and headed towards the other exit of the train. Even if it took longer, I was determined to go by bus. Once I got off the train station, I walked quickly in the direction of the park, since the bus stop was only a block away. I walked as fast as I could, but without running, because if that man was behind me, he would know I was running away from him. I turned around praying I wouldn't find him, praying he was just a crazy homeless man waiting for the train, but to my terror, that wasn't the case. Not only was he still behind me, but the man with the sheet over his head had closed the gap. As soon as my gaze fell on him, the man changed his posture and started running towards me. He was slow, but very menacing. Each step he took felt firmer than the last, full of determination and heading towards me. There was no point in pretending I wasn't terrified. I had to run too. I ran as fast as I could towards the bus station. It was my lucky day. The bus usually took a long time, but this time it was coming. I made one last dash and daringly crossed the street until I reached the bus stop. The bus almost ran me over, but it had slowed down and the doors had opened. Hey, are you crazy? I almost ran over you with the bus! There... There's a man... There's a man chasing... chasing me! Yeah, whatever. Pay the ticket. I reached into my pocket for my wallet, but it was gone. I checked all my pockets in my backpack. It was gone. Sir, I can't find my wallet. It's an emergency. Could I could I pass without paying? Oh, so that's how it goes, is it? Get off my bus now! Sir, you don't understand. There's someone There's no one out there. Either you're insane or you're doing all this to get out of paying the fare. Whatever it is, get off my bus. Now I looked around and got off. Normally, I wouldn't have done that, especially in a situation like this, but the man in the sheet didn't seem to be around, and I recognized in this man's eyes that he was furious. As soon as the bus left, I was alone once again, or at least I thought so, because from the street behind where the bus was, he came out once again, that terrifying man with the sheet on his head. Paralyzed with fear and unable to escape, the man stood next to me, walking slowly towards me. I stood against the wall, and when he came face to face with me, he stretched out his hand, trying to give me something. Hey, this is your wallet. You dropped it at the train stop. I looked down, and it was true. That was my wallet. I could see it still had money in it. Was this the reason the man was behind me? Oh, uh, thank you very much. Once I reached out to grab my wallet, the man jumped out and grabbed my arm. With the other hand, he pulled off the sheet and stuck his face to mine. It was horrible. His face was totally deformed. This man was not only homeless, but he had suffered a terrible fire that had taken his face. It was the only possible explanation. Suddenly, the man put a hand on my side so that I couldn't escape. With the other hand, he grabbed me by the neck and pressed me even more against the wall. Once he was satisfied, he threw me to the side. My only impulse was to run, to run and run in any direction of my house, crying and disgusted by what had just happened. As I ran, I could see the man standing in the same position. He didn't try to chase me. He just stood there, laughing and looking at me. 
That was the last time I was reckless enough to go back alone at night, and the next day I asked for a shift change at my job. No more night shift. I still can't explain what happened that night, but on reflection, there really isn't much of an explanation. I was just the victim of a perverse and sadistic man who saw prey in the night. I still remember him laughing in the distance, being satisfied with the fear he caused me. And I wonder what would have happened if he had wanted to do more than just scare me, and how helpless I would have been in front of him. During spring break, I got into a habit of speaking with strangers on Omega. I hail from a small city and don't have much of a social life. So the idea of speaking with strangers from across the world seemed captivating to me. That's how I came across Natasha. There was something captivating about her. It wasn't just her beauty, which was undeniable, but the way she spoke, her lively gestures, and that infectious smile. She leaned against a plain beige wall, its monotony a stark contrast to her vivid persona. Our conversation flowed effortlessly as well, traversing through a myriad of topics. She had an opinion on just about everything, from the intricacies of modern art to the complexities of astrophysics, and her insights were as enchanting as her laughter. But amidst our engaging dialogue, something peculiar kept happening. Every few minutes, Natasha's eyes would dart to her right, her animated expression freezing momentarily. It was like a glitch in reality, a brief interruption in an otherwise seamless stream. The first time it happened, I assumed it was just a distraction, something off-camera catching her attention. But as our conversation progressed, these pauses became more frequent and more pronounced. I tried to ignore it, focusing instead on the charm of her conversation. But the interruptions grew increasingly unsettling. It was as if she wasn't just looking at something or someone, but rather responding to an unseen presence. Each pause was followed by a slight change in her demeanor, a subtle shift from relaxed to slightly tense, as if she was under some unseen pressure or something. Driven by a mix of concern and curiosity, I finally broached the subject. Hey, is someone there with you? I asked, attempting to keep my voice light. My mind, though, was swirling with possibilities. The question seemed to trigger something. Natasha glanced to her right again. But this time, the pause was longer, more deliberate. It looked like she was paralyzed for a few seconds. She looked back at the camera, and the usual warmth in her eyes had been replaced by a palpable sense of fear. Her voice, once lively and confident, was now a hushed whisper, trembling with underlying dread. No one, she said, but the way she said it, it was as if each word was a struggle, a fight against some invisible force. Before I could react, she abruptly ended the chat. The screen went blank, leaving me staring at my own confused reflection in the darkened monitor. I replayed the conversation in my mind, each of her pauses now taking on a more sinister tone. Who or what had she been looking at? Was she in danger, or was it all just an elaborate act? For days, the mystery of this Omega encounter with Natasha haunted me. Her face would appear in my dreams, always turning to look at something just out of sight her expression morphing from joy to terror. I scoured the internet, doing my best to try to find her again. But it was as if she had vanished into thin air. Then, unexpectedly, I came across her again. This time, she introduced herself as Kate. The same beautiful smile, the same engaging conversation against the same nondescript beige wall. But she had no recollection of our previous encounter. My mind reeled with confusion and disbelief. How could she not remember? We had shared a connection, or so I had thought. I tried to convince her, recounting details of our previous conversation, but she looked at me with genuine bewilderment. Doubt crept into my mind. Had I really spoken to her before, or had my mind played tricks on me somehow? But then, just like before, she paused mid-sentence, her gaze shifting to the right, her face going blank for those agonizing five seconds. The familiarity of the action sent a chill down my spine. The same inexplicable pause and the same subtle look of fear when she resumed. It was exactly the same. It was more than a mere coincidence. It was a pattern, a disturbing repetition of the same eerie behavior. As the realization of the situation's gravity sank in, my mind raced with theories and questions. 
Was this a case of mistaken identity or something far more sinister? Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to take a more proactive approach. We continued our conversation, me feigning normalcy while my brain worked overtime. I was careful not to alarm her or whoever might have been watching her. Excusing myself for a moment, I grabbed a pen and paper from my desk. My hands trembled as I scribbled my first question, my heart pounding against my chest. Holding the paper up to the camera, I tried to keep my expression neutral. The note read, Is someone watching you? If yes, fake a sneeze. I watched her face intently, looking for any sign of recognition or understanding. For a moment, nothing happened, and I feared my attempt might be in vain. But then, she sneezed. It was subtle, almost too perfect, but it was a response. A mix of relief and horror washed over me. She was in trouble, and someone was indeed watching her. I quickly wrote another note. Can he harm you? Once again, I held it up, my eyes locked on the screen. She sneezed again her eyes briefly meeting mine with a look that conveyed a silent plea for help. My mind was racing. I needed to know more, to understand the extent of the danger she was in. I wrote another question, my hand shaking. Can he kill you? I held the note up, feeling like I was in some twisted game of charades where the stakes were life and death. This time, when she sneezed, a single tear rolled down her cheek. The sight of it shattered any remaining doubts I had. She was in mortal danger, and I was helplessly watching it unfold through a computer screen. Suddenly, the camera shook violently. It seemed as if the person behind the scenes had realized something was amiss. I heard muffled sounds, a struggle perhaps, and then the camera lifted, giving me a brief chaotic glimpse of her surroundings. My heart stopped. The room she was in was a mirror image of my own. The same beige walls, the same bed with its distinctive headboard, even the curtains matched mine. How was this possible? Had someone recreated my room in another location? The familiarity of it was all disorienting, making me question my own reality. Then, the camera turned, and I was faced with the most horrifying sight yet. The man holding the camera, the one who had been watching her, turned it to reveal his face. It was my own face staring back at me. Not just a resemblance, but an exact uncanny duplication. His smile was grotesque, twisted in a way that my own face had never been. It was a demonic grin, one that spoke of malevolence and insanity. The eyes, though, identical to mine, held a darkness that was otherworldly. A stark contrast to the familiar features they were a part of. Panic and confusion overwhelmed me. Was this some sort of doppelganger? A twisted twin I never knew I had? Or was it something more supernatural? A demonic entity that had taken my likeness for some nefarious purpose? As these questions swirled in my head, the screen went black. The connection was lost, leaving me in a state of shock and disbelief. I sat there, staring at the blank screen, my mind struggling to process what I had just witnessed. The image of the demonic version of myself haunted me. A chilling reminder that somewhere out there, something wearing my face was doing unspeakable things. The fate of the woman, Natasha or Kate, whoever she was, remained unknown. A tragic mystery wrapped in a nightmarish enigma. Who was she really? And who or what was the being that shared my face? And it was then that I heard a demonic voice coming from my room. A voice that shook me to my bones. Aren't you going to join us? I was bored. The snowstorm made it nearly impossible for me to leave the house for the past few days. And while I had food and mostly everything that I needed, I was at my wit's end. I desperately wanted to do something. Being a psychiatrist, I was used to my brain constantly being busy. From one appointment to the other, I rarely had time to chill or even to close my eyes for a second. And that was how I liked things. I could have called my patients, perhaps, but most had decided to opt out of therapy for the holidays. They felt better with their families, which rendered me practically useless. I hated that. And so I decided to try to make myself helpful and not bored somehow. 
I hadn't touched Snapchat in years, so I'm not entirely sure what caused me to download it and not something else, but yeah, it didn't really matter in the long run. I took a few photos and even a video or two of myself grinning at the camera. I was very good at that, pretending to be happy. So, since I have nothing better to do, I would love to give everyone advice. I ended my monologue with a wave and rolled onto my stomach, waiting for the DMs to pour in. See, I've always been attractive, which made it fairly easy to find friends like this when I was at my lowest and needed someone to care for, perhaps. Still, it was mostly good fun. I just wanted to help people who were struggling during the winter months. Within seconds, my phone pinged. Hi, sorry, but I need someone to listen to me. Can I call you? I hesitated. I knew nothing about this, Elias, and, well, it was weird to move to the calling phase so quickly, but still, I did want to help. I'd rather text for now, but once we know each other a bit better and I know how to help you, sure. Stranger danger was engraved into me, even as an adult. Oh, uh, okay, that sounds good. That was the first time something weird happened. The screen of my phone flickered twice. Colors drained from the messages right in front of my eyes. I was staring at my inbox in black and white. Quite an odd thing. What the, is this a new filter or am I going mad? Within seconds, everything went back to normal. I, I have a secret, Vicky. Huh? How did he guess my nickname? I mean, it wasn't impossible, per se, but still. Would it help you to share it with a stranger? Maybe, but I need to make sure that I can trust you. Okay, that was somewhat specific, but nothing new. I was prepared to tell him an embarrassing, somewhat exaggerated secret of mine, but the screen flickered again. Okay, this is weird. Maybe I downloaded the wrong version of the app? I need you to tell me what happened 10 years ago on this day. Oh. I mean, that was easy. I was in high school, probably getting ready for prom. I didn't remember exactly what I must have been doing, of course, but still. I was in high school like most other teens my age, probably out shopping. Yes. That's enough information for me. Okay, that was a bit odd. I tried to rack my brain, but nothing in particular came up. Maybe this Elias was an old friend who found me and decided to pull a prank on me. I mean, it wasn't that hard to find me, I guess. I was all over social media with my other accounts, so... Are you sure? Yep. Okay. But how can I trust you if you're not willing to tell me everything about you? The word everything was glitching in and out of the text. I swallowed hard. Something really was weird. Sorry, but I can't help you then. I need to go now. Bye. I made a new account, thinking that maybe something was just off with my current one. Maybe it was weird kids playing a prank on me or something. No matter what I tried to post, there was a strange filter stuck on my face. It said... It said liar with skulls around it. Okay... Maybe some people don't realize that Halloween has been over for months now? Vicky! I threw my phone on the ground, frightened. A distorted voice, quiet but almost familiar, came from my phone. Where had I heard it before? Wait. Elias? You remembered me? Good. I'm glad. What? But no, that can't be... I quivered in my seat. I knew there was no way, and yet... I want you to write a post about how much you hate everyone. Embarrass yourself in front of all your friends. Excuse me? Now, I will tell everyone what happened ten years ago. You do remember, don't you? Memories rushed me. Ones of laughter, snow, and pain. Was it... Was it really ten years ago? We were kids, Elias. We didn't mean it. And yet, I did everything he told me. He told me to take pictures with my old stuffed toys, pretending to be a kid. I did it. My online friends asked me if I was alright. 
I told him that I was just feeling a bit homesick. He told me to feign a fit and curse out the pizza delivery guy in our town. Rumors spread across the internet about the rude chick who shouted at the poor guy who was just trying to do his job. Elias would ask me to do something and I would do it. I had no choice. I begged him to just let me go. I tried to convince him that it was time for his soul to rest. But when I said that, my phone overheated, burning my hand. It was all just a game to him, and yet I did everything. You you won't tell anyone, right? Please, you know that I didn't mean it. I know, and I won't. I felt relieved. I knew that what I'd done 10 years ago was wrong, but I didn't want anyone else to know. It was a prank anyway. It wasn't my fault that Elias... But you will. I... I can't believe I'm doing this, but... It's been over 10 years. I need to come clean about what happened to Elias Smith. Me and my three friends. I wanted to play truth or dare, but we needed someone. Someone who we could embarrass. We were too cool to do stupid things like kiss each other or something. And so um, we chose Elias, who was the loser of our class. He had a crush on me. I dared him to go outside in the snowstorm in his underwear and socks and run up and down the main road since most cars couldn't drive during that time. I told him that if he did it, I'd date him, though I was just lying. Elias, he... he went out but he never made it back. To this day, he's missing, and we have no idea what had happened to him. I'm sorry, Elias, I really am. I I became a psychiatrist to deal with this, to help people who were like you. But all I've ever been is a big hypocrite, a disgusting bully. And now you've taken everything from me. Are you happy? I've been at this job for over 20 years now. And never have I experienced anything as ghastly as this. Sure, there's been times when being a trucker you have to sleep in risky spots. Places where you might not normally want to park up for the night. But the law doesn't give you that choice. This story. It's a memory I hold close. Not because I'm fond of it but because of what it reminds me of. Since it happened, I plan out every route down to the minute, to the very meter of road ahead. Since then, I found myself sleeping in much safer places. Some could call it a blessing in disguise. I call it trauma. Two years ago, I was driving along my delivery route through a 30-mile stretch of a tunnel of nothing but trees and darkness, when all of a sudden I realized it had been just over three hours and was coming up to the four-hour mark. Legally, I had to stop and rest on the fourth hour, and I wasn't planning on taking the risk of having my trucker's license removed. Besides, I'd had worse. At least, that's what I thought. I was so naive. Soon enough, as I was just minutes from the four-hour mark, I spotted a small lay-by on the road ahead. As I turned into it, I was filled with joy to see that it opened out into a small little field. I drove in. I was setting up for the night brushing my teeth and whatnot when I heard the rumble of an engine come rumbling down from the road. The stream I was brushing my teeth at was just by. My truck was sat just a couple of meters behind me. As the bright lights of the oncoming car grew closer, I became suspicious of it. It had rapidly slowed down whilst driving beside me. I stared at the blacked out windows as it crawled on past me. I spat out my toothpaste and hurried back inside the confines of my truck, closing the door only when I had seen it disappear behind the tree line. Once I shut the door, I did the traditional trucker thing and tied the seatbelt around the door handle for extra security. It's a tried and tested trucker method of keeping yourself safer in sketchy areas. Tried and tested again that very same night. After pulling all the curtains closed and in deep need of some rest, I crawled into bed, pulled the covers over me, and in seconds I was fast asleep. I awoke what felt like moments later. Although I was disoriented by the sudden interruption, I could make out the soft trudge of footsteps circling around to the front of the truck. They stopped right outside the door. 
I froze for a moment, whether in terror or anticipation, I didn't know yet. Bang! Bang! A booming noise shook the entire truck as I stumbled over and off my bed. Bang! Bang! The noise grew louder and more intense as I hurried to put on my boots, my hands trembling with fear as I tried and failed to tie the laces. Who's out there? No response came. Better get out of here before I call the cops! The warning did nothing. The banging only grew fiercer. Someone or something was trying to break inside. I darted over to the seat and shoved the keys into the ignition. The truck buzzed to life and through the curtains I saw the front lights beam across the field. I'll run you over, boy! Now get off my truck! I shrieked as I threw open the curtains. In just a moment, I saw the figure of a man dressed in all black sprinting away. He was holding a hunting knife the size of my arm in one hand and a hammer in the other. I looked towards where he was running. A black car sat over in the far end of the field. As I went to pull off, I watched in horror as the man swiveled around. He was grinning. My skin rippled as he began dangling the knife in front of his face before his entire expression went numb. And he stood there, glaring at me as I drove away. I opened my window and shouted at him. Try that again and I'll gut you! His head cocked to the side. He suddenly burst into a sprint. Whilst bolting towards me, he began wailing and shrieking as he waved the knife and hammer around sporadically. I panicked. The engine stalled. The window was still partly open as I squirmed around trying to get the engine to return to the living. The noise stopped. I swiveled my head back around and leapt back in my seat as the man pressed his face up to the glass. His teeth were sharpened and there were visible gnashes on the inside of his mouth as he gnawed at the glass. I told you! Suddenly he started swinging the hammer. One hit smashed into the glass. It shook. I kept on trying to restart the engine. A second hit. The glass started to splinter. The engine rumbled and spluttered. The cabin stank of fuel and sweat. A third hit and the glass started to crack. His eyes were wild as he hammered away. The knife in the other hand scraped against the glass. A fourth hit. The engine whirred to life. The glass reached its breaking point and I slammed my foot against the gas. The truck jolted, knocking off the crazed weirdo. His hammer was left embedded into the glass as I drove out of the lay-by, straight out onto the road. In my wing mirror, I saw him walk out onto the road behind me. He stopped in the middle and stared. Once again, he dangled the knife in front of his face. Only this time, he pointed pointed towards me. Ever since, I have my routes planned, and in the rarest case that kind of demon tries attacking again, they will be met with God's fury, and now keep a loaded rifle under my bed. I do hope that if that creature of a man comes again, that I will be able to exact the same trauma he left with me. Only his will be a waking nightmare of gunpowder and death. Several years ago, my parents had to move out of state when my dad was offered a new job, which left me in kind of a bind. I was currently enrolled in college and I didn't want to quit and move with them. So I needed to find a job that worked around my school schedule and still gave me enough money for rent. This left me only one option, taking a job as a night stocking position at the local Ikea. The job seemed relatively straightforward. Scan an item and put it on the shelf. It wasn't exactly rocket science. For the first three weeks, I worked the swing shift while I trained. On the fourth week, I was switched to nights. I was surprised to find out when I arrived that there would only be two of us working the night shift, me and my supervisor, Nick. I had worked with Nick briefly before, but never directly. He was about 10 years older, and his wife just had a baby, who we talked about obsessively. After 20 minutes of listening to Nick in the break room talk about diaper changes, he sent me to work stocking LED light bulbs in the lighting area. I noticed the Snickers bar sitting on one of the break room tables. I had forgotten to bring a lunch, so I grabbed the candy bar and shoved it into my pocket, thinking that someone left it there to take. At first, being in the dark store was kind of creepy, especially when you're alone. I kept seeing strange, shadowy images lingering around the store, which usually turned out to be nothing more than displays. 
It's amazing just how much a floor lamp behind a bookcase looks like another person. To get my thoughts away from just how quiet the store was, I decided to use my headphones and focus on my job. Sometime around 1 a.m., I noticed a light flash behind me, like someone had walked past and blocked one of the lamps. I removed my headphones, listening to the store in case Nick was calling for me. The area was eerily silent. Where's my damn Snickers bar? I heard someone whisper. Nick? After a few minutes of silence, I decided it was my imagination and put back my earbuds. Halfway through the box of light bulbs, my bladder felt like it was going to explode. A serious downside of drinking a gallon worth of Mountain Dew to stay awake. I looked around to tell Nick where I was going, but there was no sign of him. Nick? When he didn't respond, I figured he was on the other side of the store and wouldn't notice I stepped away. In the hallway leading to the bathrooms, I kept hearing Nick muttering something in the picture aisle. He was talking so low, I couldn't exactly make out what he was saying. Hey Nick, is everything okay? They listened, but didn't hear a response. I would have waited for him to say something, but I really needed to go. The lights were on inside the women's restroom. For some reason, the restroom felt even colder than inside the store. One of the faucet's hot water handles was turned on full. The sink's drain had been blocked with paper towels, allowing the water to fill up the basin. Steam rose from the sink, creating a cloud of moisture against the mirror. How strange. I turned off the faucet. Then I realized the light was on when I entered. The company had installed lights that turned off if no one was using a room, so that meant someone had to be inside. Then, I also realized that if the water had been running since closing, the sink would have flooded the restroom by then. None of which occurred to me until after I was doing my business in one of the stalls. That's when I noticed a pair of black tennis shoes standing in front of the stall. Panic gripped my throat, causing me to cough. Nick, is that you? The shoes disappeared. Then I heard the woman's bathroom door open and close. I quickly cleaned up and ran out of the restroom. As I hurried out of the hallway, I ran directly into Nick. Were you just in the women's bathroom? What? No. Why would I be in the girls' room? Nick asked. I looked down at his shoes, which were covered by protective booties. I could have sworn... Never mind. What do you need? I want to tell you it's time for a break, but it looks like you were on one already. Nick accused. Yeah, I ran to the bathroom. I paused, hearing one of the displays scraping against the tile floor. Did you hear that? Hear what? Nick asked, scanning the room. Probably a small earthquake. Then the sound of boxes tumbling on a shelf caused Nick to jump out into the main aisle. Who's there? Grab me something I can use as a weapon. Nick demanded, motioning to the shelves behind me. We were in housewares, and the first thing I found that looked like a weapon was a ladle. I handed it to Nick, who held it out in front of him to use as protection. Seriously? I shrugged. Would you rather I hand you a pasta spoon? Whatever. Stay here and call security. I'm going to go see who it is. Nick ordered. But I started to protest, but he already started walking away. How do I call security? A glass jar flew through the air, missing my head by mere inches as it crashed against the shelves behind me. Where's my damn Snickers bar? A low, grumbling voice growled. Nick! I screamed out, running in the direction Nick disappeared to. Somewhere between bedding and closet organization, I lost Nick's trail. I turned to the right, searching for any sign of Nick. I didn't want to call out for him just in case whoever threw the jar was nearby though I wasn't convinced that it wasn't Nick still playing a prank on me. I continued into the closet section, walking into the row for mirrors. There, I stood, listening for Nick. All I could hear was the gentle hum of the heaters as they turned on. Then I turned, seeing my image on the wall of display mirrors. Behind me, I could just see a grisly image of a man clothed in black, with a long, wiry beard. His crazed eyes stared at me as his lips parted to smile, his teeth blackened, 
and missing. Look, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was your Snickers. The candy bar was still in my pocket. I took it out, offering it to the man who snatched it from me like a wild animal. Freeze! A security officer called out from behind the man. Nick ran from behind the security officer to me, holding onto my shoulder. Are you okay? I nodded, shaken by the experience. The man's name was Henry, and he had suffered from schizophrenia all his life. It turned out he had snuck in through the dock that evening. He'd been living in a warehouse behind the store for many years. The typical security officer, Mike, who worked the night shift, would bring Henry a Snickers bar in exchange for staying off the property. However, that night, Mike had called off sick, and the new guy had forgotten to give Henry the candy bar that Mike had left in the break room. I continued to work the night shift from time to time throughout college. Whenever I did, I made a habit of always carrying a Snickers bar, just in case Henry showed up again. I was seven when it happened. My family and I were visiting Chuck E. Cheese, which was once the best pizzeria in town. It was my birthday, and my parents wanted to treat me with the best food and entertainment money could buy, within our budget, of course. Now, at first, you might be thinking that I'm the victim of this story. No, far from it. I was only a witness. At the time, it was just my sister and I along with our parents. Margaret was around five years old. It had just turned five in the afternoon when we pulled up in the car park outside, and the weather was far too cold to stay out in for too long. Once we were out of the car, we hurried inside as a flood of people came rushing out, all walking to their cars. It must have been the entire restaurant that left as the second we were inside, we realized that it was just us. The restaurant was practically empty. As my eyes scanned over the room, I was quite shocked at the state of the place. There were tipped over tables, food splattered against the floor, and not a worker in sight to deal with any of it. Do you want to go somewhere else, Kathy? My father asked. There's got to be at least one table still free. Could we have a look? My father smiled. Of course we can, honey. Just as the four of us started walking, my eyes tracked something moving in the far side of the room. I turned my head to follow it. I was now staring at the face of Chuck E. Cheese himself, his head poking halfway out of a door that read backstage. I felt my skin shiver as it began sinking further and further back into the door, closing it slowly behind him. Suddenly, my ears pricked up at the sound of the animatronics as they began playing a new song at the same time that my mother called out that she had spotted a table. Found one! We all swiveled around. The relatively untouched table sat motionless in the opposite corner of the room. It was right below the stage and extremely close to the backstage door from earlier. I had another scan around the room, but that really was the best we were going to get. So, cutting our losses... We all went and sat down. Ah, that's right. There aren't any workers here. My father pointed out. I need the toilet, Margaret wailed. Okay, Catherine, you take Maggie to the toilet and your mother and I'll try and find some bloody service around here. And with that, the two of them stood up and began prowling the area for signs of life. I took Margaret's hand and began leading her over towards the toilet To my surprise, the sign for the toilet was plastered right over where the backstage sign had been. Just a few meters away, I saw backstage written on an entirely separate door. I thought I might have just made it up in my head, so I pulled Margaret towards the one that had toilet written across it. On our way, I started to notice more and more about the establishment. The place looked borderline derelict, as if left untouched for years, left to rot. How were people still visiting? As we came closer to the door, I stopped to peer at it. There were these foul and grubby finger marks plastered all over it. I ignored it again. If the rest of the place looked so disgusting, then it was no surprise that the door would be the same. I could see Margaret needed the toilet badly. She was starting to squirm. I took a deep breath, placed my hand on the door, and in we went. It was completely pitch black inside. As I tried to find the light switch, taking Margaret's hand behind me, I led the both of us along the wall, searching for it. We had only moved a couple of meters, but the darkness had completely enveloped the both of us, even though the door was still wide open, letting just enough light in for us to see a figure pop up from behind us. 
The light suddenly cut out as the door slammed shut. Someone was in there with us. I held Margaret close to me, staring at where the door was. A red light suddenly appeared. The face of Chuck E. Cheese appeared with it. It hovered for a moment, not moving, just staring. After just a few seconds, it vanished. I held Margaret even tighter as I began sprinting away in the darkness. I couldn't see where I was going, but any direction was better than the one that led to that thing. The panic blinded me. I ran straight into a wall, almost with enough force to knock myself out. For a moment, I lay on the ground, dazed and confused. Once I regained some sense, I realized that my hand had let go of Margaret's. I went into a frenzy. I threw my body around the floor, begging to find her, but to no avail. Hope was slipping until I heard a shuffling noise emerge from behind me, followed by a muffled scream. Got you. I only had one choice. I leapt up and shrieked as loud as I could. All of a sudden, a stampede of loud footsteps came charging towards the door from the outside. The room filled with light as my parents came storming in. What are you doing back here? At that moment, I realized we weren't in the bathroom at all. I was backstage. My parents' eyes soon stopped staring at me when all three of us noticed the Chuck E. Cheese mascot standing in the corner of the room right next to the exit door. One of its hands was leaning on it. The other clutched hold of Margaret. There was a large gash on her forehead. Her eyes were closed. I turned back to face my father, but he was already charging towards it. In response, the mascot dropped Margaret and threw itself out the door. My dad lost it down the alleyway outside. After that, we called both the police and an ambulance for Margaret. The police investigated the place and found bodies scattered all over. There were a few under the stage, but the main lot were all stuffed behind boxes backstage. Margaret had been this close to joining them. Shortly after, the police shut the place down. The mascot responsible for it all was never caught. However, the police had managed to find the costume. They reported that it was filled with dried blood and bits of rotten flesh. Nobody knows what happened to the person inside. Our family never returned to a Chuck E. Cheese after that. Every costume could be hiding the murderer. It was only a matter of time. It was around 11 at night. I was driving to my very first shift at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. I had recently been hired there as a mechanical engineer, having previously worked at a car manufacturing company. I would never have left, but the entire business had gone bankrupt. Some kind of corruption amongst the higher-ups, it seemed. My new role consisted of maintaining the animatronics during the night so that they would be fully functional for the daytime masses. I was still a little worried that I didn't know how animatronics worked properly. The man from the job center who got me the position had told me that my knowledge of cars would be more than enough to handle the task of keeping them maintained. I hoped he was right. As I pulled into the car park, my phone began vibrating in my pocket. I parked up and accepted the call, seeing it was from my new boss. Hey there, son. I take it you've arrived by now, and I thought it was time I gave you a quick note about your job tonight. You see, uh, the animatronics were built a very long time ago by the company's co-founder, and the spring locks inside their chests are incredibly dangerous and fragile. For your sake, please only work on the circuitry within their headpieces. That's all for now. Good luck. I didn't even get a chance to respond. He'd hung up immediately after he explained what to look out for. It seemed odd he'd tell me something so important so late. I thought about it for a moment, but soon realized I had better get started soon. I only had until 6am to get everything sorted for tomorrow. After getting out of my car, I went around to the boot and reached inside to grab my toolbox. Once it was in my hands, I locked the car and made my way to the front door. Once inside, I began making my way through the entrance corridor. Only a couple of seconds had passed before I heard the pad of footsteps coming from my side. All of a sudden, from around the corner came what looked to be a security guard. His hair was greasy and his eyes were bloodshot. He spoke gruffly. Hiya! You're John, right? The new mechanic? He said. I found the voice familiar. Yeah. 
Well, you sure have your work cut out for you. They're all in the back, down the hall and to the left. He then moved past me, slapping me on the back as he walked off. Nervously, I began to head towards the location given to me by the guard. As I trekked through the carpeted halls, an air of nostalgia came over me. I used to be a fan of this place as a kid. Every Sunday, straight after sports practice, my father would take me here for lunch. He used to tell me that my mom would have loved to have been there too. She died giving birth to me. The thought of it made my stomach churn. In almost no time, I had made it to a door labeled Restricted. I stared at it for a while, the red words seeming to be oozing off of the door, as if newly painted. I soon snapped out of it, and finally pushed it open, making my way inside. The instant my body crossed over the doorway, I paused, my eyes suddenly filled with awe as I stood there trying to take in the countless animatronics all over the place. They weren't the main four, but they had the same feeling either way. The colossal pieces of mechanical genius stared back at me, their eyes lifeless. Trying to regain focus, I decided it was time to get to work. I remembered that the one closest to me resembled some kind of a pink hippo holding a guitar. Feeling a little intimidated, I slowly crept over to it. Carefully, I set the toolbox down below it and peered inside the mouth, searching for the circuit board. I was surprised by how razor sharp the inside of it was. Immediately, I imagined what would happen if someone were to get their hands stuck in it. It was a nasty, bloody image. As I looked around the mouth, I was finally able to spot the circuit board wedged all the way back at the entrance of the throat. To my surprise, I knew exactly what tool was needed to check it. I bent down to grab it. That was the moment I heard the door behind me starting to creak open. I waited for a second, my eyes locked on the toolbox. I made sure to keep my body angled so that I could see the door. My mind whirred. In total shock, I watched as the security guard poked his head in, being careful not to move the door too much so he could remain hidden. His face had almost completely changed. His smile had gone and was replaced by this horrific grin that practically screamed the words, I'm going to kill you. My skin crawled as I saw him move closer inside, still thinking I hadn't seen him. I could easily tell that he wanted to hurt me. To try and protect myself, I reached my hand into the toolbox, as if working as usual. Only this time, I was grabbing the screwdriver. Just as my fingers gripped it, the hippo animatronic in front of me whirred to life. The room was filled with bright, flashy colors alongside a song being sung by the hippo himself. At the same time, the guard suddenly launched himself in my direction, revealing a large hunting knife from behind his back. Without any hesitation, I responded by swiveling around, only to be hit in the face by one of the guard's knees, throwing me back onto the floor. The second I hit the ground, he threw his body on top of me with his knife at the ready. The screwdriver had already fallen out of my hands, but as he landed on my legs, I was able to throw him up into the air with one powerful kick, fueled by adrenaline. Somehow, the force of the kick was so strong that he lifted straight up into the air, right as the hippo dislocated its mouth, trapping the guard's head with its metal jaws and beheading him shortly after. The corpse landed flat with a thud next to me. My eyes were wild with fear. Not knowing what else to do, I chose to run away, hearing the sound of metal scraping against bone and flesh on my way out. As soon as I left the building, I called the police, and under an hour the police arrived, and an investigation was carried out all over the establishment. I heard back from them the very next day. The body was gone. There wasn't even any splatters of blood. The only thing out of place was the hippo animatronic. It had fallen over on its front. I also discovered that on the shift timetable, there was never even a guard shift that night because I was there to keep watch. My mind still struggles to understand who the freak was, how he got the guard uniform, and why he wanted to kill me. And most of all, why did the boss's voice sound so similar to his? I quit the day after, and I haven't gone back since. 
There's not a day I wake up without thinking that life is really mysterious. From the moment you wake up every day, you don't know how your life can change from one moment to the next. You don't know if something special will happen to you, if your life will take a turn, or if it will be just another normal, boring day. Another thing you don't know either is if it will be the worst day of your life. That day, the worst day of my life, caught me totally off guard. And believe it or not, it started with a simple Snapchat message. It all started during a normal weekday night. My husband, Ethan, is a doctor and usually works night hours, so I tend to spend my nights alone. At first, I was quite worried about it, but over time, I got used to it and just went on with my life. I admit that I even benefited from this, since being a writer, I had the whole house to myself and I could concentrate more easily. That night, I was gonna take it easy. I was just gonna eat, go to sleep, as I was very tired and wanted to see my husband in the morning. After dinner, I was about to go take a shower when a Snapchat message caught my attention. When I saw the message, it was from an unknown person who was following each other and my husband. Once I accepted the message request, I read it and a sudden feeling of panic came over me. The message said that I had to go to the hospital as soon as possible as an unstable patient attacked Ethan, so he was in serious condition. Almost without hesitation, I ran to get my car keys and go see my husband, but something caught my attention. Normally, I would have rushed over, desperate to see what was wrong with Ethan, but that night, I can't explain why, but when I saw a news item on TV, I just stared at it for a few seconds. On the news, a young reporter said that kidnapping cases were increasing exponentially in the state and that we must take all possible precautions to avoid being another victim. Feeling even guilty for doubting the man on Snapchat, I called my husband, but no one picked up. I rushed to the front door of my house, but as I was about to open it, something popped into my head. At first, I thought they had no way to contact me besides Snapchat, since Ethan had his phone blocked and no one could find out my number. But Ethan has my number in case of an emergency. Why would they have to look me up on Snapchat? Before opening the exit door, I decided to write another message to the guy on Snapchat. I asked him for a picture of Ethan on the gurney to confirm that what he was telling me was real. Up until that point, the guy on Snapchat, who was supposedly a coworker of Ethan's, had been replying to me pretty quickly as if he was paying attention to my messages. But at that moment when I doubted him, something changed. Instead of a message, I received a picture. That was a picture taken at this moment. The picture was of the front door of my house and through the little window in the door, you could see the back of my head. Shocked by what I had just seen, I looked out the window of the door and saw them. There were two silhouettes in the dark, standing there, looking in my direction, unafraid that I would see them. I ran to the dining room where I knew they couldn't see me and quickly called the police. At that very moment, the power in the house went out and the glass in the front and back windows shattered. Someone wanted to hurt me, and it wasn't just one person. I knew I had to hide until the police arrived. Stalling for time was my only salvation. I hid under the couch in the dining room, praying that no one would find me. And that's when I saw them. My house started to fill up with feet walking around, probably looking for me. There were at least three people in the house, all wearing terrifying masks, and they were splitting up and covering the exit doors. The man in the mask with the smile was in charge of checking the dining room, and I felt he was pretty close to finding me, knocking in all the tables and furniture, he was getting closer and closer to the couch. If he came closer and knocked it over, what could I do? Should I try to tack it? Should I try to run away? Neither option seemed good. The man was a few steps away from me. Was I supposed to be there? But that was impossible. The chair had a cloth on the bottom that gave the impression that the base was touching the ground. It was impossible for him to imagine that I was here. Once the man was next to the chair, his feet were almost touching my hands. I held my breath as long as I could. 
I froze in fear and my body went numb to the possibility of being caught. Where were the police? What was taking them so long? I couldn't hold back a second longer. I couldn't control the tears coming out of my eyes and I had to cover my mouth to keep from making noise. Everyone thinks I could handle a situation like this, but no one knows what it feels like to have something like this actually happen to you. I wanted to scream, to run, cry. I was panicking next to a man who was looking for me to do who knows what to me. Suddenly, I felt an impact on the couch. Had I been discovered? No, the impact was different. The man who was looking for me kicked it in frustration. She's not here either. I searched the whole dining room. We should leave. I think she's called the police. I made it. They weren't finding me. I breathed a sigh of relief as the man sat on the couch above me. I closed my eyes waiting for them to leave. As they said, the police would be here any minute. The man above cut the call short and I heard him begin to type a message. really should have put your cell phone on silent mode. Defenseless against my attacker, the man grabbed me and hugged me so I couldn't run away. His companions quickly joined him, putting a cloth bag over my face and tying me up. I could only kick and scream helplessly, stopping only to beg for mercy. I could feel a man pick me up and begin to carry me away from my home. I heard the sounds of a car door and someone throwing me into the suitcase. The car started up and sped off. I can't explain how horrible that moment was. I felt that my life was over and that I would never see my loved ones again. I used the last of my energy to cry. This was the end. Suddenly, I felt a loud bang in the car and I hurt my head hitting the back of the trunk. Dizzy, I heard gunshots and saw how a few seconds later, someone opened the trunk. They weren't the men in the masks. They were cops. Apparently, I was not the only person who called the police, as my neighbors also saw strange people in front of my house and alerted them as well. I was taken to the hospital where, ironically, I met my husband, who was safe and sound. I told him everything that happened, and at that moment, he realized he didn't have his cell phone and hadn't found it all day. Regarding the telegram man, I didn't know him. I just followed him back a few weeks ago. At that moment, I realized that all the kidnappings were coldly planned and carried out with time and patience. I was also about to be a victim of these people, but somehow I survived. I'll tell you the truth. I don't really have a moral or anything from the story. I only learned that the world is much darker than I thought and how from one day to the next, with a simple Snapchat message, your life can end. It was the day Omegle had to shut down. The allegations put forward over the decade of its existence had left the company in bezel with thousands of court cases. And the company had to file for bankruptcy. I lost my job that day. I was in charge of maintaining the code base of the website and was also assisted with the customer support team. It meant I practically had no knowledge of the legal side of things up until it was publicly announced. It was the final day in the office. I was finishing collecting my things and packing them into a tray to return home with. It reminded me of cleaning out my locker at the end of the school year. The office is practically empty by this point. I was one of the last ones left as I had to upload the goodbye message onto the website, explaining to people why Omega had vanished. Once finished collecting my stuff, I looked back, reminiscing on my time there. The place used to be so lively, full of excitement. Now, it's empty and lifeless. I closed the front door on my way out for the final time, walked over to my car, took a step back, and stared up at the office block. Half a decade of my life had been spent working here. I felt miserable leaving it. I drove off, a few tears pouring from my eyes as I realized it was finally time to move on. But just ten minutes into the drive, I went to reach for my phone to play some music, only to realize it was back at the office. It was getting dark, and I usually wouldn't stay in the city past the sunset but my phone was certainly worth going back for. In a swift motion, I turned the car around and after just 20 minutes of driving, I was back. As I wandered towards the front door, I was slightly shocked to see the door was left slightly ajar. I swore I closed it, but there was every chance the tears blurred my memory just as they had done my vision. By this point, the sun had completely set. It was winter, so the days were far shorter. 
The darkness seemed to swallow the building, as nobody worked there anymore. There was no need for nighttime lights. Walking inside, I made my way up the stairs and into the central office area, feeling indifferent to my surroundings. They seemed strange to me now, distant even. The office was empty. Every single desk was ransacked of personal belongings. Sighing, I dragged my feet over to my old desk where my phone was sitting. It glowed brightly as I picked it up. As I turned around, I turned the flashlight on as it was a little too dark for my taste, only to reveal countless sheets of paper strewn all over the floor beside me. It came as quite a surprise to me, considering I had been there just 20 minutes before when the place was clean, almost back to when the company first bought it. I moved my flashlight around, revealing that the paper led towards a tipped-over file cabinet opposite my desk. That's when I saw the empty bottle of vodka. A few drops of the stuff were still dripping onto the floor below. My skin crawled. Was somebody here? I had thought. I went over to the light switch, flicking it on. Again, to my surprise, the switch did nothing. The power company must have already severed the building's electricity now that nobody worked there. I continued to scan the room with the flashlight. The place looked like a bomb site. Desks had been flung over everywhere and piles upon piles of folders lay scattered all across the floor. It was at that point that the one responsible for the mess made himself known. My heart fell as I heard a loud groan erupt from one of the main offices towards the other end of the room. I looked over to where the sound seemed to have originated from, only to find that the door to one of the manager's office was left wide open. As I moved towards it, I saw that there was a dim light leaking from it. As I crept towards it, my eyes bore witness to some of the papers on the floor that were leading towards the open door. I turned my phone to light them up. On almost every page, there was a court case with a picture attached. I can't bring myself to describe them in much detail. I can only say they were grotesque and utterly despicable images. Leaning down, I read some of the allegations made by some of Omegle's users. Again, it seems insensitive to repeat exactly what I saw, but Predator seemed to come up more than enough to rationalize the company's central issues. I had some idea of the allegations, but to see them in the flesh made me feel sick. My stomach churned as I rose back up, resuming my journey to the mystery door. Eventually, I reached the office where the sounds were coming from. They had been repeating the whole time, groan after groan, low, like an animal. Peering in, I had my phone in my hand with 911 on the dial at the ready. I had no idea what was inside, but to keep myself safe, I decided the precaution was more than worth it. Even now, I don't know what drove me to stay. I could have just walked away. That place wasn't my problem anymore. But for some reason, my loyalty stayed. Inside, I recognized the face of one of my managers, drunk, blood oozing from one of his eyes. All around him were those same revolting images I had just seen scattered all over the hallway. Pages and pages of complaints, all evidence with images of fully grown men doing utterly intolerable things. It was at that moment that I realized my flash had come into the room with me. The manager slowly started to look up. He gouged one of his eyes out. Instantly I leapt back, slapping my finger on the call button as I watched in horror as the manager stood up, trying to stumble towards me. My eyes traveled all over his body before focusing on what he was holding in his hand. There was a knife grip between his fingers with bits of his eyes dripping off of it. Adrenaline surged through me as I backed out of the room and started bolting towards the exit door. From behind, I could hear him yelling at me. Get back here! You've seen too much! Luckily, I was easily able to outrun the drunken mess and even managed to lock him inside. As I held my body against the front door from the outside, I heard him charge into the door over and over, wailing. A couple of minutes passed before the police finally arrived. They head inside, and after just five minutes, 
My eyes widen with terror as they wheel out the manager's corpse in a stretcher. He died from blood loss. He cut out the other eye. It was discovered later that they had found a note with his dead body. The note explained that the manager felt responsible for all the atrocities committed throughout Omega's lifetime. He simply couldn't bear to look at it. Couldn't bear to live with it. I have a copy of the note. I read it over almost every day, staring at the final part of the note. It says that he wasn't the only one responsible. There were... There are others, too. Homelessness. The living nightmare itself. What could be worse than starvation? Night after night, feeling the stomach eat away at itself as the elements thrash at your exposed flesh through the tattered sleeping bag. People, people are worse. Some give you dirty looks in the streets as if you're some subhuman nuisance to their day. Some are somewhat nice and give you what spare cash they have on hand, if it's convenient for them. But one of them, or what I can only assume to be a person, homeless too, perhaps. He wanted my flesh. Even ten years on, now living in a comfortable flat with a wife and two kids, I truly have emerged from the lowest point of my life. Yet, the memory of that things, it stuck. During my twenties, back when I was still somewhat fresh at uni, I had a problem of sorts. Drugs. I couldn't live without them. Night after night, I spent my time deep in the powdered lines and packets, unable to escape my own desire. It wasn't long before the uni found out, expelling me for it. I tried going to my parents for help after that, but they were done with me too. Out on the streets, no degree to my name, I was homeless. I roamed for about three years since then, from town to town, always searching for a busy central area to make some petty cash. At the same time, I was still recovering from the horrors of drug abuse that tortured my every waking thought. Every penny I made, I used on buses for the next town, sometimes food, and on the very rare occasion, a warm shower. That was until I came across a town from the earliest parts of my childhood, back when things were simpler, before the drugs. There was the spot that my dad and I always used to go for adventures in. From what I recalled, it was a little clearing behind a couple rows of bushes that sat neatly beside the town's river. Remembering the spot, I decided it would be a perfect area to sleep for the night, at least from the elements. It was warming to see that it was still there. The shrubs surrounding it had grown tall with age, and the tree covering it stood almost as tall as the bridge hanging above it. How time had passed us all. It had been a long bus ride and the sun was dipping beneath the horizon. I had just enough time to trek along the riverbank up to the little gap in the bushes where my father and I used to enter from. I first pushed my backpack through to break away at some of the twigs that had grown inwards over time. Yet, as I pushed it through, I was met with a little resistance. Had this part of the bush not grown since? I had thought. Feeling my backpack fall through the other side, I decided it was my turn. Feeling utterly exhausted, I forced my body through until I clattered out the other end. I fell to the dirt with a hard smack. Once I had stabilized myself, I peered up, excited to feel the flood of memories come rushing in. The place was a dump. There were large heaps of rubbish lying everywhere. Tattered sleeping bags strewn across the mud, used syringes stuck out of the ground, some lay on empty cans, and in the center, a foul, rancid smell arose. There was a pile of meat in the middle. At the time, I guessed it must have been a hotspot for the homeless, perhaps even teenagers looking for a drunken adventure. It was heartbreaking to see my once beloved spot being used with such a lack of respect, but what position was I in to be judgmental? I sucked it up and found a relatively clean spot over in the corner, furthest away from the entrance. As I climbed into my rotting sleeping bag, I felt the childhood memory seeping in. One by one, I drifted to bed, tears gushing from my crumbling eyes. What must have been hours later, I woke up to the sound of leaves rustling from the other side of the pile of trash and flesh. As my eyes flickered open, I was made immediately aware of the source of the rustling. A dark figure stood in the entrance. 
It was far too dark to make out any details, but I was able to see that the figure was holding a sleeping bag loosely in one hand. I took it he was homeless too, yet for some reason he just stood there. The bushes blocked out the noise of the wind so all I could hear was his breathing, thick and heavy. It didn't feel too threatening at the time, but I remained silent. I had no idea what the figure was capable of or what he would do if he… He moved. Step by step, he wandered over to the pile of meat in the middle. Upon reaching it, he dropped down to his knees and stuck his face straight into it, gorging on its contents. The sight of it was putrid. He guzzled, gobbled, slathered, and ripped at the spoiled meat, green and grotesque. Was he really that starved? Hey! I shouted. I felt I had alerted him of my presence. My mouth moved on its own. What are you doing, man? That stuff looks like it's been there for... His head flicked around to face me. He stared at me, blood still dripping from his teeth. He started to smile. Suddenly, a mouthful of sharpened teeth revealed themselves to me, along with his nails, roughly sharpened. In an instant, he charged. As he bound towards me on all fours, I flung the sleeping bag from my legs and threw my body into the bushes behind me. My eyes bulged as I hurled myself through the sharp sticks and vicious prods as I crawled towards survival. The sound of teeth clamping down behind me sent streaks of terror straight up my spine as I felt his presence following me closely behind. The instant I emerged from the shrubbery, I bolted away, leaving all the contents of my backpack behind with that thing. Once at a distance, I checked behind myself for the man. Only a head was poking out from the bushes, staring at me, drooling with hunger. It's that day I forced my life to change to avoid ever being back on the streets again. The following day I called the police, explaining to them the state of the clearing and the cannibal living there. But being the homeless man I was, they didn't believe me. Upon arrival, it seemed all the meat I had mentioned had previously been fed on had been taken. Only the wreck of the homeless camp remained. That's what they called it. But I knew, and still know it's real. The Homeless Meat Grinder. Musophobia. Sometimes I wonder how such a rare word, a word that hardly anyone knows, means so much in my life. Musophobia is the irrational fear of rats. However, to tell you the truth, my fear is not irrational. There was a time when rats didn't scare me. Maybe they disgusted me a little bit, but never fear as intense and as strong as the one I feel now. Do you know what caused this phobia? A sick, disgusting, but most of all, evil being. It all started while I was working at Chuck E. Cheese. I know, an ironic job to start being afraid of rats. The Chuck E. Cheese in my area had a reputation for being a pretty clean place, but that's only what it showed the customers. In the kitchen and basement area, the place was pretty dirty. That wasn't always the case. The place used to be clean and well kept. That all changed when Adam, the new manager, took over. Make no mistake, the man loved Chuck E. Cheese. He was always very concerned about the place, doing everything he could to keep it running smoothly. The problem came from his personality. We would always see him in strange situations, walking with his head down, like he was hiding something. Many other times we found him spying on us. We were forbidden to call him on the phone or enter his office without having spoken to him first. Besides, something had changed on the premises. We didn't understand why, but the place had gotten much dirtier. The dirtiness of the place coincided with Adam's arrival, but he was not in charge of the cleaning, so it was inevitable to wonder if he had something to do with it. Anyway, as good a cleaner as he was, everything was fine as long as we stayed away from Adam. The only problem was that I accidentally got too close. That day, we heard a lot of noises from the basement. The place was usually abandoned. We had no reason to go there other than to check the boiler or water in the place. My team leader told me to go see what was causing the noises, but first I had to ask the manager for authorization. Adam's door was locked, so we thought he was locked in as usual. We knew we shouldn't disturb him at that point. At that point, I decided that I was going to act without the manager's authorization. There was no way I was going to get in trouble since even a cook like me should have a minimum of autonomy to work. 
so I simply went down the locked basement that was located in the warehouse. I must admit that once inside, the place looked darker and more imposing. It was as if you took a haunted room out of a horror movie and put it in part of a Chuck E. Cheese. With the darkness rolling around me and the strange feeling that I was making a horrendous mistake, I took my first steps into the basement, and that's when I saw it. At the end of the room, I could see a dark silhouette moving, and it was the cause of the noises. You see, normally, in a situation like this, the obvious decision would be to call security, right? Well, not in my case. There was something else that caught my attention about the silhouette. I could see he had the manager's jacket on. How had he gotten Adam's clothes? Had he stolen it? I approached the man to confirm my suspicions. Was this Adam? What was he doing here? And why was he staring so obsessively at a drawer? Any other person would have noticed my presence, but not him. He was staring at that drawer so obsessively that he didn't seem to notice anything around him. Once I got some distance behind him, I could confirm that it was him. But it was like he was in a trance. Hey boss, are you okay? As soon as I touched his back, the man was startled and dropped the box, which fell to the ground. And do you know what was in that box? Rats! The box was full of rats! Dozens and dozens of rats covered the entire basement of Chuck E. Cheese. They were desperate, running from one side to the other, escaping or looking for food. All the rats started running desperately all over my body, while Adam seemed to go into a state of panic and go completely crazy. No! My rats! Come here! Boss? You! This is your fault! You caused this! Boss, I'm sorry. It was an accident. You won't get out of here alive, you know. I always wanted to get my hands on you. On that round little face. I always wanted to smash it. I tried to reason with Adam, but it was impossible. At that point, he was totally out of it. Suddenly, I heard a scream coming from the stairs. It was a co-worker. Oh God, what happened? Did you find a rat's nest? No! They're my rats! Leave them alone! They're mine! Faced with another person, Adam seemed to forget about me for a moment and I took the opportunity to run for the exit. Once I got to the door, both my coworker and I panicked at the horrifying sight. Adam was lying on the floor, jumping up and down to grab all the rats that were still running around in his arms. The terrified and hungry rats were biting him in self-defense, but he didn't care. He just kept grabbing them. Had our perplexed look, he raised his head and looked at us once again. What are you doing here? Leave us alone! And that was all I had to hear. I closed the door from the outside and locked it when my coworker called security. Soon after, an ambulance came and took Adam away. Rumors spread fast around here, and we soon learned the truth. Adam suffered from a strange paraphilia that made him obsessed with rats. He was the one who brought the filth into the place, bringing and releasing rats to make nests in the Chuck E. Cheese, then putting them in his box and collecting them. Obviously, Adam never went back to work at Chuck E. Cheese, and if the rumors are true, he never went back anywhere, as he began receiving medical help in an insane asylum that day. As for me, I could never see another rat in my life. I had to give up Chuck E. Cheese because every time I saw the rat animation, it scared me. I can't help but think of all those hungry rats that scoured my body in desperation, looking to escape from a psychopath who held them captive. Every night, I think the same thing. What would have happened if my coworker hadn't gone into the basement? I think only Adam knows. Hey guys, my name is Tom. Like most of you, I grew up playing horror games. I was always more of a horror game fan. But whether it was how scared I was in the beginning, how hard I struggled with getting through Night 7, or how much I talked about it with my friends, I have to admit that Five Nights at Freddy's always had a special place in my heart. So you can imagine how excited I was when I found out they built a Five Nights at Freddy's inspired restaurant near my house. The first thing I did when they opened was drop off my resume. I really wanted to work there, as that game was a big part of my childhood. I didn't leave my resume alone, because my friend Ralph was just as obsessed with the game as I was. 
After dropping off our resumes, we had a group interview where we both did very well. Shortly thereafter, I was told that we were both accepted for the job, so you can imagine how ecstatic we were. Little did I know that this beautiful experience would turn into a nightmare. A nightmare from which I could never wake up. It all started on our first week of work. As I told you, I was very happy. But Ralph, Ralph was something else. He was having the time of his life, enjoying working at the restaurant like it was the best thing that ever happened to him. All day long, he would talk about Five Nights at Freddy's and how similar the restaurant was. At this point, he even seemed obsessed. (laughs) At work, everyone made fun of him. Everyone asked him questions about the game just to tease him and no one took him seriously. Ralph was my friend, and I was the only one who knew what he went through when he was younger, so it didn't seem right to make fun of him, but no one cared. Little by little, we got used to the restaurant. Ralph, though, didn't calm down. Listening to him talk about his little obsession became a regular occurrence. Everything was normal. Until that day. That day, everyone was working in the restaurant, as it was a special day. The whole restaurant had been rented out for a big party for some rich kid's birthday. The day was quite difficult as we were asked for things nonstop, and we even had to dress up as the animatronics from the video game. We were all stressed out except for Ralph. He was the only one who liked to get into character and he played until the customers left. I couldn't help but notice that there was something off about him. His eyes seemed unfocused, and his gaze was lost. In their innocence, the children were having fun, but none of them paid attention to the fact that next to them, there was a terrifying face staring back at them. When it was time for the children to leave, we all began to settle in to open the restaurant to the public. But something happened. A mother started running around the restaurant in desperation, saying that her son was missing. The boy was no more than five years old, and according to his mother, he was quite shy and would never run away on his own. We searched the entire restaurant. While some went to look for him outside, I was sent to look for him in the basement. I walked slowly through the place, listening carefully to see if the boy was crying. Once I was downstairs, the nightmare began. Someone downstairs, in the dark, came up the stairs to close the door. The darkness took over the entire room and only the sound of this person's footsteps could be heard. One step after another, after another, after another. I didn't know who he was or what he wanted, but his very presence had frightened me so much that I was paralyzed. Once he came back down, some dim lights came on and revealed the identity of the person. It was Ralph, but something had changed about him. His face was red and bruised, his smile was obsessive, and his eyes were lost in madness. Ralph was totally out of his mind. Ralph, you have the child, don't you? Of course I do. I left him in Chica for when it's time to use him. It spoke to you too, didn't it? This may not be the real Fazbear's Pizza, but this restaurant has been talking to me ever since I came here. Don't you see, Tom? It all adds up. Ralph, tell me the truth. Have you stopped taking your pills? It doesn't matter. What matters is that the restaurant has told me everything. Don't you see? The bite of 87. This restaurant wants me to recreate it. Listen, Ralph. You won't do anything to that kid. You know you're sick. You have to take your pills or the hallucinations start, remember? Suddenly, Ralph reached out and the lights went out again. Slowly, I began to hear his footsteps again in the darkness. These footsteps were not going in any specific direction, but were surrounding me. The room was completely silent, but I could feel him breathing heavily, and this terrified me even more. Tom, I think I'm a little bit upset. I don't want to hurt you, but I think I'm about to do it. Suddenly, many of the animatronics in the place lit up, as if someone had done it by remote control. Upbeat music and movement took over the whole room. I knew Ralph was about to hurt me, but at that moment, all I could think about was the boy. I rushed to Chica's suit, and after opening her mouth, I pulled the boy out. He had his eyes closed and a big bump on his head, but he was alive. Meanwhile, Ralph still didn't make his move. He just kept walking, stalking me, ready to attack me when he saw it necessary. I picked up the boy and started running as fast as I could. I ran up the stairs in the dark, but I felt something pull me by the foot. It was Ralph, crying loudly. He grabbed my foot and tried to bite it. But I kicked him with my other foot and he fell down the stairs. 
Once on the floor, I could see him in the center of the basement. He was no longer trying to catch me, but was violently punching himself, all the while laughing like a psycho. Hey, Tom! You think if I hit myself enough, I can become like the purple guy? <laughs> And at the image of my friend hitting himself over and over again without stopping, I left the place and left him locked up. The boy's family was very grateful, but needless to say, that was Ralph's last day at the place. When the police arrived at Ralph's house, his family was also dead on the floor. They had been dead for days. Ralph killed them with his own fists. Apparently, my friend wasn't taking the pill that stabilized his schizophrenia and he began to think the restaurant was possessed. Ralph needed professional help, and today he's more stable. On my own, I could never again play Five Nights at Freddy's or go to the restaurant. I know it's a completely ordinary place, but every time I go in, I still remember Ralph telling me that the restaurant was talking to him. I know it's illogical and makes no sense, but why bother? I'd rather not even go there. It was my first ever shift. I had been job searching for just over two months when a position at my town's local Ikea opened up an opportunity. Not having much other choice, I went for it. I was 17 at the time and highly unqualified, yet somehow I got the job. On my first shift, my other coworkers almost immediately came up to me and warned me not to make any mistakes. One of the more friendly ones, Sam, looked exhausted and terrified. Our boss, he's not right. There have been many before you who supposedly quit on the first shift, but nobody ever saw them leave. I say Mr. Walker had something to do with it. He's been to prison, you know, though he won't say why, so don't ask him. Avoid him all you can. After giving me the warning, he left to go and get started on the task for the day like cleaning and restocking the shelves, running inventory, etc. I kind of just stood there for a while, unnerved, scared even. When I applied, I was never even given an interview. They just accepted it. He just accepted it. Once I got going after that, however, the rest of the shift went pretty well. I was on till for around two hours before being moved on to restocking like Sam was doing earlier. As he handed me the clipboard and pen and pointed me to the storage room, he whispered to me, Jessica, Jessica was the one you replaced. She went missing just a week ago on the exact same shift you're on now. Please, be careful. I opened my mouth to answer him, but he had already moved off after putting the supplies in my arms. I was a little shaken to say the least, but I had to keep going. It sounded like this job was volatile, not sure if that's the right word to call it now, but I think you get the picture. After checking the first half of the store, the announcement came that the store was closing. As I watched the final few customers leave, I began making my way over towards the back of the store, where I thought the rest of the restocking was needed. The deeper I went into the store, the more I noticed the shelves were growing emptier and emptier. There was a no-access sign next to one of the final corridors. I ignored it, thinking it was for customers only. Sam was at the opposite end of the store. He was logging the profits and cleaning out the front desk. I checked around me before entering. It seemed darker. The lights were dimmer the further I traveled into the restricted zone. Just a few steps in, I noticed a foul, rotten smell. I breathed in once, reeled back, and had to cover my mouth to avoid vomit. It was utterly grotesque. I stepped back and the smell faded. I stepped forward and it intensified. I squinted and looked further down the corridor, searching for the source. At the very end there was a metal door, open. There was a red light glowing from it. It looked far too odd to explore alone, so I radioed for Sam. Hey, Sam, could you come to the back of the store? There's this horrid smell and a weird door. I don't know what it is, but I'm coming. He was blunt, like he already knew. Moments later, a clamor of footsteps came thundering down the corridors of shelves. I'm here. Where's the door? Sam arrived promptly. He was panting, out of breath. 
his face red with panic. Right there. I pointed towards the door. His eyes followed my finger, and at once we were both locked onto it. The door. Slowly we crept towards it. Soon enough we arrived outside the door. And peering in, we froze. Sam lurched back, also covering his mouth. His face went green. I stood there, paralyzed. I was now facing a room full of thick metal cages, small and filled with the corpses of rotting flesh. All of them were still wearing the IKEA uniform. Some had gnashes in their skulls, some had severed necks, but most were still somewhat fresh. Oh god. Sam stuck his head back around the corner. That's... Trembling, his hand lifted up and pointed towards one of the cages. There was a woman's body in it, her hair ripped out in large clumps, her lips white and dry. That's Jessica. Suddenly, a loud thud of footsteps and tools clanging echoed from down the corridor. Still brimming with disgust, we backed out of the room and stood stiffly in the middle of the corridor. Mr. Walker, the boss, stared at us. A deranged look of shock blazing from his eyes. Carefully, he put down the box he was carrying. As he laid it onto the floor, I soon noticed that Sam was backing up in the corner of my eye. My eyes then refocused back to the box. He was pulling something out of it. Inch by inch, a meter-long machete was carefully drawn out of the box. The metal glowed in the dimly lit corridor. There was blood dripping from it. Sam grabbed me by the arm. Run! Instantly, he pulled me back and we ran into the room, slamming the door shut behind us. He held the door whilst I dialed for the police. Simultaneously, Walker reached the other side of the door and began to hammer into it, slashing it with his blade. He wanted in. Sam's face winced with every smash, every shout, every threat. He remained firm, however. The bodies of all his previous co-workers drove him to stay put. After around 30 minutes, the sound of police came charging down the corridor. With floods of tears, we opened the door and showed them the horror surrounding us. Even the police appeared shaken. They asked where he was, the man responsible for such a vile display of inhumanity. He was gone. After that, the store was brought under new management once all the bodies and cages had been cleared. Mr. Walker was revealed to have been jailed for homicide several years ago. He had murdered both his wife and kids back in the 80s. Since then, Sam and I have never returned. Instead, every now and then, I join him to visit Jessica's grave, amongst the many others. I took a shaky breath before starting. I was so used to pretending to be distraught that it was second nature to me to hunch my shoulders and look as if I'd been crying for hours by then. A few people skipped me, which made sense, but then I saw her. Large, worried brown eyes burrowed into mine. Perfect. With trembling hands, I held Emma's photo close to my chest before briefly showing it to the camera. For a second, I thought that girl was about to end our conversation, too. But then, her gaze softened. Oh, hi. Are you okay? Wait, I can actually just talk to you. Are you well? No. I... To be honest, I'm on here for a good reason. I flashed her a smile, weak and barely there. It's been three months since my girlfriend Emma disappeared. I have been looking for her for so long, but she's nowhere to be seen. A well-timed sob invoked a sad look. Great. The authorities are refusing to do anything, so I'm looking for people here, but I I'm sure you're busy. No, I'll help. My brother went missing six years ago, and he never came back. The tears in her eyes made me want to squeeze her tight to my chest. What a catch. The chick was seriously adorable. Still, I kept my act. See, I'm just not attractive enough to score a woman by any other means. Sob stories work, though. And, well, the one about Emma wasn't exactly a lie. What can I help you with? I mean, are there any plans to go and search for her, or...? 
Just as she finished her sentence, I prepared to answer her. I was quite good at that part of the conversation, used to explaining well the need to meet someone face to face, but my image on the camera froze all of a sudden. Hello there, Jacob. Huh? Is this some sort of prank? Are you okay? You're staring ahead like, Jacob. I blinked once, then twice. The messages disappear from the screen. It takes me a moment to gather myself. I needed a second to gather myself, but it was okay. All I needed was another chick to open her heart to me, but fate had other plans. Jacob, sorry, I think our connection was lost or something. Yeah, it was kind of ironic. I flipped through a couple of gross men trying to hit on me. Dudes, I'm a dude, and, well, ended up on Dora again. To be fair, she was quite pretty. I've been spending most of my money on finding Emma, so my internet isn't all that good. Liar. Again, I saw it. The messages pop up in the chat window. I swallowed hard. If Dora was the one calling me a liar, why was she staring at me with such an empathetic look? I'm so sorry to hear that. What the? I'm sorry, but I think something's wrong with my computer. That's okay. Would you prefer to meet up, maybe? I'd be super happy to listen to your story and, you know, your plan of action over some coffee. Perfect. Though, I preferred the idea of meeting at my place. I mean, that was the whole point, right? All I needed was an excuse. No, don't fall for it. The screen started glitching out just as I was about to say something. Screw it. I threw the nearest thing to me, a heavy book, at the wall behind my computer. Jacob, what's going on? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, Dora. I... I'm not entirely sure what's going on. I think someone's hacked my computer or something. Why would anyone do that? I hesitated. I had some ideas, of course, but, well, I was not going to tell her any of them. For once, no clever lie rose to my lips. Especially not when I caught the terrified look Dora was finally giving me. What? What the... I only saw her for a second. By the time I whirled around to see what Dora had noticed before me, it was gone. I'm sorry, I... I should have known this was going to be some sick prank. I bet you're going to post it all over the internet, you... No, you don't get it, I... How did you know my brother's missing? That's not it. Stop it. Murderer. This time, we looked at the chat window at the same time. Dora's eyes widened as photo after photo loaded into it. All of my handiwork, things I was proud of, things I already wished I could do to Dora if she were to reject me after seeing my face properly for the first time. You sick. Before she could have said anything, Dora's face morphed into that of Emma's. She looked exactly like the time I'd last seen her, eyes mad terrified. Sorry, Jacob, but I can't let you taint another girl. Don't you remember what happened the last time you tried? I did. I still have a small scar on my face to prove it. Cindy, a woman I met off Omegle, seemed nearly possessed when she slapped me across the face the second she saw me. Wait. It's been you all along! You've been spoiling my plans! I won't let you hurt any innocent souls. I won't. That was the first time I was ever scared of my ex-girlfriend. I'd always had the upper hand with her. And, well, when I thought she was cheating on me, I made sure that she got the punishment she deserved. But then, why was she there, in front of me? I'm calling the cops. Things stood still for a while after that, as sirens filled the silence from outside. I realized that there was nothing I could do. Emma had found a way to outsmart me from beyond the grave. Though maybe that was for the best. Maybe I was too sick to meet others or even to repent. Though, 
If that was the case, I wouldn't have been placed in a mixed prison with a lot of beautiful women. I was fresh out of university, 21 years of age, and finally single. I was in my flat reading over the final few breakup texts from just days before. Her name was Emma. I stared at them for a good hour or so, trying my best to process it all. Reading through them all, I felt no need to cry. There was no sadness or disparity left within me, only fear. I was terrified of her. It had only been three days, but it already seemed like such a distant memory. Every single one of her messages reeked of manipulation and the signs of a true psychopath. The worst part of it was my responses. Pretty much every text I replied with consisted of, I'm sorry, or it's my fault. I never once stood up for myself, and even trying to tell her no would be enough for her to guilt trip me. One accidental step out of line and she ignored me for days, forcing me to come crawling back to her every single time. It wasn't as if I had anyone else to go to, either. At the beginning of our relationship, she went through my phone and messaged every single one of my friends, telling them I was going away and not to talk to me ever again. On our second date, I remember my phone going missing. That was probably when it all started. I could even see it at the end, too. One of her final messages read, You don't need anyone but me, Evan. I am your one and only. Now stop acting so ridiculous and maybe I'll forgive you, but you better make it up to me. I could hear her in my head. Her voice was shrill and angry. By that point, I had already been trying to get out for months. I just didn't have the courage to leave, to tell her what I really thought. I skipped through the rest of the messages, going all the way down to the final one, the nail in the coffin, the goodbye. I'm done, Emma. Goodbye. I read it out loud. I was so proud of myself. I was finally free. Right underneath it, before I had the chance to block her, she had already sent a reply back. You've got some new bitch, haven't you? Even reading it now, I still cannot believe I fell for her. The emotional horror she put me through still haunt me even to this day. It was like my life wasn't even mine. I took a deep breath after I finished rereading them all. I then swiped off and opened Tinder. That was my freedom. I swiped left, right, left, right, right, etc. My inbox was filled with messages, new people. God, it had been so long. My eyes were in total awe at just how many women there were, all of them so beautiful. But deep down, I still struggled with the fact that any one of them could be another Emma. Looks mean nothing when the inside is rotten. However, I refused to let the memory of Emma ruin any more of my life than it had done already. I had a date the following week. Her name was Libby. A week later, I found myself sitting across from Libby in an Italian restaurant, gorging on pizza. The restaurant was close to both of our homes, so we didn't have a train or a bus to catch, so the stress was light. We spent the whole of the night laughing, smiling, and talking. The date really couldn't have gone any better. That was until I turned around, looking for a waiter to get us another drink. My eyes immediately locked on a familiar face pressed up against the window outside. I blinked, too stunned to speak. Then they vanished. My heart rate soared. I needed a moment. Excuse me, Libby. I'm just going to head to the toilet. No worries. Don't be too long. Our dessert will be here soon. She smiled at me, and for a moment, I felt safe again. I walked off in the direction of the toilet. My expression had dropped the instant I turned around. Emma was there. I remember trying to cover my cheek as a few tears had begun drooling down it. Once inside, I tried to take a deep breath, wash my face, anything to slow myself down. I was already sweating heavily from the armpits. I needed to regain control. But just as I went to dip my face below the tap, the sound of heavy, feminine breathing started from within one of the stalls. Slowly, I began to lift my head to face the mirror. The second my eyes leveled with it, I saw a window at the top of the closed stall. It was wide open. 
I saw my face drop, my eyes started watering, my entire body froze. I told you, Evan. I told you, no others. A voice came from within the stall. It was full of bloodlust. I began to back away, but it was already too late. In an instant, the door was flung open, revealing none other than Emma standing in the middle of the stall, a knife gripped tightly in her palm. I went to lift my hands up, as if to tell her to calm down. Wrong decision. Her nose flared, and her eyes started burning. You broke the rules, Evan. I told you no others, and you do this? I can't let this go unpunished, Evan. You deserve this. All of a sudden, Emma burst out from the stall, knife in hand. She charged straight towards me and managed to plunge the knife right into my leg before I hooked her on the side of her face. The force of the blow knocked her straight back into one of the closed stalls. Seeing my opportunity presented itself before me, I dashed straight for the exit. Whilst limping out into the restaurant, I screamed for help as I watched my blood spurt all over the floor. There were plenty of people in the restaurant, so I was quick to be helped. I pointed towards the bathroom, directing some of the men to keep the door shut so she couldn't get out again. Fortunately, Libby had seen me and was already on the phone with the police. An ambulance was on the way too. Once my leg was wrapped up to stop myself from bleeding out, they arrived all at once, flooding the place with flashes of blue and yellows. I watched as the police stormed the bathroom. Finally, it had to be over now, but to my utter surprise, they came out with her body. She'd slit her throat. She was dead. Since that day, my physical wounds have healed, but as for my mind, well, the trauma won't even leave me. Libby and I are together now. I'm finally happy. I'm mostly happy. Every night I go to sleep, Emma is staring at me. There's blood dripping from her throat. She's smiling at me. I won't ever be free. My story all started on the 10 freeway, heading through Los Angeles, when traffic came to a complete stop. This wasn't unusual. SIG alerts on the 10 were a common occurrence. However, that day was different. There was a fire nearby that prompted the entire freeway to shut down for several hours. For a person, driving a normal car being detoured off the freeway can be frustrating and annoying. To a trucker driving a 16-wheeler, it's a freaking nightmare. After a five-hour delay in bumper-to-bumper traffic, I was finally able to make my delivery and pick up a new trailer at Long Beach Harbor. My typical route has me driving from Austin, Texas to Long Beach, California and back, carrying who knows what. Typically, it's crap from China, like toys and housewares that discount stores sell. I don't usually pay attention to what's in the back unless it's alive or needs refrigerating. On my way back, I opted to take the 91 freeway, which I had forgotten during certain times. I mean, most times it too was a nightmare, yet it still beat taking side streets around Los Angeles to get back on the 10. So, after another two-hour delay, I finally found smooth sailing into the desert. By this time, it was around 8 at night, and I was feeling the day wearing on me. Unfortunately, I had a schedule to keep, and nearly seven-hour delay in traffic had thrown my schedule way off. I knew it was against the rules and even the law for me to drive beyond my allotted hours, but I figured as long as I wasn't caught, I could make up some time if I drove through the night. I pulled into a gas station in Indio at a quarter past nine to fill up my tanks, grab a few Red Bulls and some dinner. I hated drinking Red Bulls because they always made me jittery, but it was the best way to assure I'd stay awake. As I walked back to my truck, I noticed a guy walking along the off-ramp, thumbing for a ride. Where are you heading? I called out. I had to call out a few more times because he couldn't hear me over the freeway traffic noise. He decided to come over instead to talk to me. Going? Oh, uh, Phoenix. I sure could use a lift. Picking up hitchhikers was frowned upon, but I had done it dozens of times before. It was one thing to listen to the radio, but to have someone talk to you during the drive was certainly a lot better. Well, hop in. I'm heading to Texas. You're on my way. I offered. 
He didn't hesitate to do just that. When I was about to head out, though, he remembered he left something back by the freeway. I didn't really want to wait, but I already told the guy I'd give him a ride. Ten minutes later, he returned with a backpack, like the one soldiers use in the military. You serve? I asked, pointing to the backpack. He grunted, his attention peeled to the side mirror. Two tours in Iraq. He returned, making it apparent he didn't want to talk about his time in the service. I never served. That back and all. Not that driving a truck ever helped that. What's taking you to Phoenix? I asked the guy. It's John, by the way. I offered my hand to shake. Mitch. He turned to me, scowling. I heard my old lady just had a kid. I doubt it's mine, but I thought I should check it out. He turned back to the side window, staring obsessively at the mirror. Oh, I was going to say congratulations, but I wasn't sure I should. For miles, he continued to watch the side mirror, not saying a word. His staring was starting to get to me, which caused me to ask, Are you watching for something in particular? Just then, the truck ran over something in the road, causing the steering wheel to jump into my hands. When I did, a loud thumping noise began to beat against the side of the cabin. I immediately thought I blew a tire, which wasn't a big deal because there was another tire on the same side to compensate. You might want to pull over. It sounds like you have a flat. Mitch mentioned several times, finally convincing me to check it out. As I slowed to pull over, Mitch kept watching the side mirror. We were in the middle of the desert and the only people that were around were in the cars passing us on the freeway. There was no moon that night, making it even more unnerving. Something about the way Mitch was acting by constantly looking at the side mirror put me on edge. I pushed away the thought, thinking that it might have been the Red Bulls messing with my head. I jumped down out of the cabin to inspect my rig, then suddenly everything went black. When I woke, I was in the passenger seat of my cab. Once the fog cleared, I realized Mitch was driving. What the... The back of my head was throbbing like mad. You passed out. I thought I'd help by driving a few miles. Mitch said, his eyes shifting to the rearview mirror and to the side mirror far more than out the front window. I can't let you drive. It's... uh, It's against regulations. Pull over. I could lose my job if someone else was seen driving my truck. When I demanded that he pulled over, Mitch pulled a pistol from his backpack and aimed it at my face. I suggest you sit there, be quiet, and let me drive. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed bright red and blue lights shining on the road several miles behind us. Typically, I don't care much for cops, but when I saw those lights, I swear I could have hugged one. I'd suggest you pull over. You've got some friends on your tail. Friends? (laughs) Right. Tell you what, once we make it past the state line, I'll drop you off somewhere. Dead or alive? I asked seriously, noticing the crazed look in Mitch's eyes. Mitch didn't respond. The police cars grew closer, surrounding my rig. I hadn't seen so many police cars in one place in all my life. What the hell did you do? Mitch laughed nervously. Shut up. Just... The gun went off, shooting through the passenger side window. The glass shattered, sending shards into Mitch's eyes. This gave me the chance to grab the wheel and pull over. Next thing I know, I'm on the ground with my hands behind my back. He took my rig! I'm, I'm just the driver! I yelled out, hoping they'd believe me. An officer helped me to my feet and uncuffed me while another held my license out. John Packard? He asked. I nodded. Were you aware you were transporting escaped felons in your trailer? The officer asked. The officer then showed me that the lock had been cut on my trailer. Mitch had arranged to pick up his buddies after they escaped. Why he didn't kill me, I'll never know. The police let me go after. A short time later, I noticed a sign by the side of the road. State prison, don't pick up hitchhikers. Needless to say, I haven't picked up another hitchhiker since. The party was pretty wild. Even as I left the club, I kept tapping my feet to the beat of the music playing. I was giddy. Though the club was in a rather unsavory part of town, I tried not to think about it too much. With the cool night air sobering me up fairly quickly, I became aware of my surroundings. 
but there was nothing to worry about. Nothing could happen on such a good night, right? Hey, kiddo. Huh? I stopped in my tracks with a voice coming from my right. I wanted to just walk on, but I couldn't. After all, the stranger sounded kind. Hello? Sorry for giving you a fright. I'd later come to know the man as Toby. He was... he was an interesting fellow. Clearly a lot less fortunate than I was. Based on this old, ragged clothes and odd smell, it was fairly easy for me to realize that. But, well, I wasn't the one to judge. I'm sorry, kid, but I'm really hungry. Could you buy me a burger from that place down the street? It'll only cost you a few bucks, and you'll make this very old man very happy. He wasn't that old, but that didn't make his plea any less significant. Clearly, he's seen better days. And, well, I had some cash left. You know, I'm hungry myself, actually. So why not? Want to come inside with me? It's surely nicer than... No. He said that really quickly, his voice loud and sharp. I took a step back, my head pressing against the old brick wall behind me for a second. For a second, I felt cornered. Ah, sorry. They don't like my kind in there. Apparently, I scared off their customers or whatever. Oh. I took a deep breath, forcing my lips to curl into a smile. Well, that did make sense. That's all right. I'll just grab something for us and we can share. We can have them on the riverbank. It's pretty cool this time of year. Aren't you cold, though? He didn't answer, just shrugged. I guess he was just used to it. It took me a few minutes, but I made it to the local burger joint relatively quickly. It was pretty empty for the most part, save for a few other night owls who seemed to be quite a bit drunker than I was. As I lined up to get our order, I noticed that the server was looking at me oddly. However, she still gave me my food with a big smile. Maybe she was used to being hit on by oddballs late at night? Here you go, man. Wait, I forgot to ask your... I'm Toby. That was all he said as he took his burger before flashing me a near toothless grin. Anyway, come. It's better for us to sit down somewhere than to eat standing up. We're not horses, are we, Marcus? That was a bit odd, but I shrugged it off. It was clear that Toby had a bit of an odd sense of humor. I didn't mind it. I prefer to see people smile than frown after all. Still, just as I took the first bite of my burger, he spoke up, his eyes never leaving my face. That was a bit creepy, I admit. You got any extra cash? I could really use some. I, well, I didn't. I mean, I had my card, but most ATMs in the area were locked off by now mostly due to the sketchy people wandering around at night. And as much as I was okay to give some food to a random person I didn't know, I was not okay with fueling whatever addiction he had. Sorry, not really, no. Really? I saw your card when you were paying for the burgers. Okay. What? Look, man, I'm a broke student. I was happy to get you some grub, but I can't afford to give you money. Are you sure? Just a few bucks would make a huge difference to me. Sorry, but I can't. I stood up. Suddenly, the pleasant company I'd had turned sour, and I didn't feel comfortable anymore. I need to go home. I have a math exam tomorrow. Do you? Yeah, I do. But tomorrow is a Sunday. Isn't that why you went out tonight? He was getting... weird. I was unable to pinpoint just why, but it felt like he knew far too much about me. And, well, I didn't like that at all. Maybe, but I still need to go. Stay. The way he grabbed my wrist hurt. Despite how frail he was, he had a strong grip. Still, it was fairly easy to push him away. I started walking away, but quickly picked up my pace. Maybe I was wrong, but... There was something sinister about Toby that made me want to leave as far as I could. Okay, okay. I get the hint, kid. Go. He sounded defeated. I wanted to stop somehow, to tell him that it wasn't him, that I was just paranoid. But I didn't. Despite the fact that he didn't move from the riverbank as I left, my fingers lingered on the emergency button on my phone as I went, just in case. I got to my street reasonably quickly. After all, I lived near the bad parts of town. Jeez, just what the heck was that? 
As I stumbled to find my keys, I heard it. Footsteps. I thought maybe someone else was out at this time. Still, something just felt off. Suddenly I felt as if the fresh cool air had gotten stiffer. I felt almost suffocated. When I turned around to check the source of the noise, I almost screamed. It was Toby, standing only a few meters away from me with a baseball bat in his hands. I really only wanted some cash, kid. I don't want to hurt you, but I've got payments that are due. Can't you help an old man out? Toby, I'm gonna call the cops. You... He was much faster than I thought he'd be. I blinked and suddenly he was standing in front of me, grinning. His toothless smile made me shudder. There was something uncanny about the way he was staring at me. Maybe I should have given him the money, but I didn't want to. It just didn't feel right. Please, leave me be. I don't have anything to give you anyway. I know you have money, kid. I know a lot more about you than you like. I've been watching you after all. He was trying to get into my head. Or maybe he was telling the truth. I, I wasn't sure. But what I did know was that I should not have turned my back on him as I made my dash into my apartment building. I woke up on the floor a few hours later, shaking from the cold. Toby was nowhere to be seen. The same could be said for all of my belongings. Still, even now, months later, I have nightmares of him watching me. Maybe, maybe I should have been kinder to him. Maybe then, I wouldn't feel like he's constantly after me, ready to strike the second I put my guard down. Maybe. I was just about giving up on getting a decent job when I got a call from the IKEA I'd applied to a few months back. The previous security guard who worked weekend nights only left due to a minor workplace accident, and they were willing to pay me well to start as soon as I could. I tried to ask about the accident, but the interviewer told me not to worry. The kid was completely fine, just a bit shaken up. I could relate to that. I'd gotten hurt like that before. It's hard to go back to places where you feel like history might repeat itself. So, I didn't think too much about it at the time. As long as I could get money, I was happy to do virtually anything. After all, I was basically on the brink of being tossed out of my apartment for being unable to pay rent. I shook my head as I stared at my reflection in the mirror. This really isn't the time to think about this, dude. I've worked many night shifts before and I liked talking to myself. I also liked exploring the floor of whatever store I was working at, which is why I'd been fired a few times. Apparently people preferred to keep security in their rooms and never on the floor of their stores. Oh well, those times have passed. I was encouraged to roam the Ikea by my current boss, a middle-aged man with bug eyes and a crooked smile. I mean, they have cameras everywhere anyway, right? Not that I could steal. Just as I was talking to myself, I really did enjoy my own company for the most part after all. A large thud echoed in the empty showroom. Huh? I approached the source of the sound cautiously. It was one of the small kitchens, complete with a stove and everything. There was a broken vase on the ground, shattered into pieces, but the oddest thing was that the stove was on. Is this even plugged in? I went around to check, but as I'd suspected, it wasn't. Well, that's a bit odd. Still, eyes must be playing tricks on me. Had this been my first night shift as a security guard, I would have freaked out. However, I wasn't a stranger to being pranked by other employees. And, well, the IKEA was massive. It felt like the perfect playground for some bored teens who thought it was fun to mess with their elders. Very funny, guys. I almost got worried about the ghost you guys were talking about earlier. I caught the day shift guys right as they were leaving the building. One of them called me crazy for taking on the night on my own. Maybe that was his way of preparing me for what came. What are you guys up to now? I was getting a bit agitated. I needed the money, and that meant staying calm and not getting into a fight with whoever had snuck in to mess with me. However, that was harder than I thought. I tried to make my steps heavier, slamming my work boots against the ground as I walked. 
You know, if I catch you, you're going to have a very nice chat with the manager. I bet that's not what you want, right? A few meters from the kitchen I'd been standing in was a bathroom. I expected my work friends to be there, as that's where the most recent crash came from. But there was nothing, just a shattered mirror on the ground. Well, there was something else, too. A weird note with Get Out scribbled on it. Okay, this is getting weird. Then again, the whole situation was a bit weird. Why would someone who'd worked all day sneak in just to mess with a newbie? It had happened to me before, but I still couldn't grasp just why. And, well, against my better judgment, I felt that there was someone or something in the building with me. But that was impossible. See, when you work security for a long enough time and love snooping around places you should not go to unless there's an emergency, you start to recognize the sounds people make. Walking, moving around, even just breathing. There was nothing. Okay, this isn't funny. Something just didn't feel right. It felt like I'd been wandering the rooms for hours by then. And yet, when I looked at my watch, I was only ten minutes into my shift. Okay, I still have seven hours to go. I'll just sit down and hope for the best. My plan failed. I went up to the door of the security room, but it was locked shut. What the hell? I wrestled with the door until it eventually gave way. By then, I was panting, terror creeping up my spine. Something wasn't letting me relax. Words froze in my throat as I barricaded the entry. Just what on earth was going on? Only then did I realize that the cameras I was supposed to watch were still very much on. Okay, that's good. Let's just... let's just find those punks. I bet you're all laughing your heads off. I know it's you. Kids, I... no matter how much I stared at the footage, I found no one but me in the store. I was truly on my own, and yet... and yet I, I hadn't noticed it much before, but the rooms themselves constantly moved. A glass switched places with a vase here, a TV turned around there, and so on. Is this place haunted? I wanted to laugh, but I couldn't. Suddenly, I felt the air in the room shift. It was so cold all of a sudden. I heard it again. Laughter bounced off the wall, loud and sharp. I felt cold, heavy arms wrap around my body, keeping me in place. And then, I ran. The only feasible way out was through the windows. The store's main door was locked, and I didn't have the time to mess with the alarm system. Luckily, I wasn't too high up. It didn't feel like such a hard thing to do, but it was still a struggle, dragging my body around with what felt like hundreds of pounds of extra weight on me. Let me go! I managed to somehow twist my body around, and within seconds, I was out. But as I ran away as fast as I could, something landed atop my head. It was a sheet of paper, sticky and gross from the rain. The wind must have ripped it off whichever building it was plastered to. As I tried to check it out with still trembling hands, I realized that perhaps there was a reason why I'd been offered a lot more money than normal for the job. It was a missing poster, and the name on it was awfully familiar. I never thought I'd end up in a situation like this, hiding from the public eye like a creep. Funnily enough, it all started with me getting Tinder. I'd just gotten out of a serious relationship. I spent ten years of my life with Tanya. She had once been everything to me, only for her charm to fade rapidly when I realized it had all been a lie. Still, that's a story for another day. In the end, it was the app that had forsaken me. I'd used it before, albeit somewhat clumsily. I wasn't really the type of guy to just go up to a woman and ask her out, which somehow translated to me being awkward online as well, but that didn't matter to me. I wanted companionship. However, it didn't come without any hurdles. Tanya, she... She's always been scarily good at tracking my online activity down, after all. Just let me see you one more time. She even called for a wellness check at my old job. The police said you don't work at the office anymore. Are you okay? Let me see you. 
You've blocked Tanya from contacting you. To unblock her, I kept ignoring her. And finally, after a few days, she gave up. I... I couldn't keep on living with her chasing me around like that. I needed to be able to do things. And so, I trusted that Tinder would match me with other people. People who would learn to appreciate me. Liz likes you. Sarah likes you. Effie likes you. I sought out the embrace of someone who could accept me for who I was. A few weeks were spent like that, with me running after women who'd never give me the time of day. One was more beautiful than the other, but they all seemed to be just messing with me. Tracy likes you. Gosh, can you get any more boring? I feel like I'm talking to a wall. I thought a drummer would at least know how to talk to people. Sorry, but I'm allergic to cats and lazy people. Bye, just bye. Tracy was everything I wanted. Hey, I know that this sounds a little silly, but I saw that you have a cat in your pictures. I recently lost my cat after 10 years, so that warmed my heart. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, Whiskers is getting a bit old, but she's great. She's missing her mom, though. I deleted what I'd written as quickly as I typed it, telling myself that this wasn't about Tanya. No, this was about me and Whiskers. She could use some love from others, though. Really? Yeah, we moved to a smaller place recently with her, so she's been a bit antsy, to be honest. Oh, I see. Maybe she needs a garden to roam. You could always bring her to my place. My Whiskers used to love running around in there. Her cat was called Whiskers, too? What a coincidence, I thought. I, I guess. I let out a sigh. I liked where the conversation was going, but I just didn't really know how to keep it going. I knew that it was expected of me, and yet... So, Tom, you didn't say much about yourself on your profile. What big secrets are you hiding? Saved by an angel, I thought. Though, the question made me a bit nervous. Not much, to be honest. I'm unemployed at the moment, but seeking a job soon. I, uh, had some rough times. Oh, I see. Would you like to talk about it? I can always go over to your place and comfort you. I... Maybe not yet. Sorry, it's just that I don't know you very well and... That's okay, I understand. I guess you're smarter than I gave you credit for. Nothing came after that. I wanted to punch myself in the face. Tracy sounded perfect, and yet I couldn't even answer her question without offending her somehow. Still, the more I stared at her picture, praying for her to send me a new message, the more I felt like she was... familiar. I shook the feeling off. I stared at my screen, hands itching to write, but just before that, another notification popped up on my screen. Huh, that was more popular than I thought. It made me smile a little. At least I could forget about Tracy for a bit. Or so I thought. Elizabeth was stunning, though she seemed to be quite secretive about herself in her bio. Hi, handsome. As silly as that is, the compliment made my cheeks flush. It was nice to be cherished. Tanya used to be really good at that. Hi, pretty. Let's drop the formalities. Want to meet up? I was startled. I knew that Tinder was full of people like her, who wanted nothing more but quick love, but I was a bit worried. S still, I was desperate to at least meet up with some people. I've been very lonely. Yeah, I, I guess. Wanna grab a coffee first, or...? No, I trust you won't do much to me. We can meet up at your place. Does now work for you? I stared at the screen for a second. Something about that message ignited that little warning siren in my head. I wasn't sure what it was, but I wanted to be cautious. Still, I didn't want another conversation to end so abruptly. I guess. Awesome. I'll set out now. I quickly typed where I lived into the app, deciding that Eliza must have forgotten to ask for it. That perhaps should have been my clue to run away. But I was so, so lonely. On my way to see you, handsome. Huh? I remember confusion as Tracy messaged me right after my last awkward attempt to talk to her. Maybe she sent it to the wrong person, I wondered. Still, she'd blocked me. Sorry, uh, wrong... Is it though, Tommy? 
something snapped in me then. I wasn't sure what it was just yet. One minute, I was giddy, getting ready for my date. The next, worried. Are you playing with me? Do I seem that desperate? No, my love. I'm the desperate one. What? Only a few seconds later, Tracy sent me a message. But the picture wasn't of her. No, it was Tanya holding my cat. Poor Whisker snuck out again. Don't worry, I'm bringing her back in. Tanya. Yes, my love? Yes, my love? Gosh, you're still as clueless as you used to be. So innocent. So silly. Don't worry, I'm almost home. Whisker still knows her mommy. Thanks for letting me back in your heart after last time. I needed to run, but I heard the door slam shut loudly. Was she in my apartment? Uh, But how? Had she found my keys? Oh, Tommy, where are you? Tanya looked different from how she used to. Her hair was unkempt, her bloodshot eyes. There was a tremor to her hands as she stuck her head in through the door, rotting teeth curling into a disgusting grin. She held a knife above her head and a pair of handcuffs in the other. I've looked for you all over the place, and now I have you. I can bind you to me forever. I don't know how, but I managed to push her away, her frail bones creaking as I pressed her into the wall. I wanted to punch her, and so I did, and then I ran. It's all been just an elaborate ruse and nothing else. Only Tanya was foolish enough to care about me, but I didn't care. I I did what I had to and then ran out as far as I could. And now, now I don't think anyone could find me. I live in the forest like some animal. Somehow, I still hope that someone will seek me out. I remember that at some point, I wondered what C was like. All I knew about him was that he was rich and that he needed me to transport his wares with the utmost secrecy. I tried my best for the most part. I mean, my truck was old and quite worn down. A few things had fallen out of the trunk before, though I was able to salvage most of it. As long as it didn't snoop or allow someone else to see what I was carrying, C didn't care. I had only angered him once, but I preferred not to think about that. Imagining his distorted voice screaming at me through the phone still sent shudders down my spine. Okay, that's enough rambling to yourself, Jared. If someone saw you, they'd think you're going crazy. I mean, maybe I was. With my only connection to the world being seen, it wasn't really much of a connection, honestly. It wasn't much for me to do. As my mother once said, I was a bum. A failure living out of my truck. No one really cared about me. Maybe that was why C was so willing to employ me. His jobs came with weird instructions and even stranger products, but he paid well. That was all that mattered to me. I shook my head at that, pushing the address into my fancy GPS device. C was the one that gifted to me a few years ago when he learned that I didn't have one. It was oddly good at guiding me through empty roads. Today's shipment was a bit weird. A single cover lay in my truck, tucked safely behind some blankets and other knickknacks. Apparently, it was very expensive. To me, it just looked cursed. When I moved it into the truck, the old antique wood made a shrill noise as if I was hurting it. Of course I wasn't. I was just doing my job. Not that I care as long as the boss pays me well. I huffed to myself, joking. Hands on the wheels, I started following the road to wherever I needed to go. I was over half a day from my destination, so I really needed to get going. If possible, try not to stop too many times in your way today, Jared. And... Please, be discreet about your cargo to the police. It's an antique. I wouldn't want them to destroy it because they think something is wrong with it. Okay, boss. That made sense to me. I'd encountered the cops a few times on the road, and they were often quite clumsy. I still remember one time they broke a mirror in the back. I wondered if they ended up being cursed because of it. My grandmother used to be very superstitious. As if... Curses don't exist. Only stupid cops do. The fact that those two were in an accident straight after letting me go finally had nothing to do with... A weird loud noise broke me from my thoughts. At first, I thought that a tire had popped. Seriously? What the... 
As I made my way to the back of my truck, I realized that my precious cargo had somehow rammed itself against the hood. Trying to escape, are you? No answer came, of course. I couldn't help but chuckle a bit at that, pushing the box behind some others again on the side. You know, sometimes I wish for a bit more fun. I love it if something crazy happened. But, well, sometimes boring is better, right? The next hour or so was mostly uneventful. I sang along to the radio, trying to keep cheerful. Somehow, I felt a bit down. It was hard for me to explain why, but I didn't want to keep driving on. Maybe I could take a small break. It wasn't the brightest idea. But anything was better than crashing because I fell asleep at the wheel or something. I'd seen it happen a lot, and it really wasn't pretty. I pulled over to the side and hopped out of my truck ready to walk around to feel a bit more alive. And that's when I heard it for the first time. Let me go! Let me go! Huh? Let me go! Let me go! I heard those words loud and clear, repeated again and again. But they sounded as if they were coming from inside. Inside my head. Okay, I must be going crazy. My phone buzzed again, and I couldn't help but roll my eyes a bit. I couldn't just drive for days without taking a rest. Still, I did feel a bit odd about C being so hands-on for once. Could you please hurry up? We really need your cargo. Did he know that I'd stopped for a break? Maybe he was tracking my GPS. Sorry, boss, but I need to take a quick nap. I'll be back on the road before you know it. C's text blew up my phone, so I just chose to ignore them. I knew that I might lose my job after that. But I just felt so tired, so off, that I knew I had no choice. I slept like a baby for a good five hours before hitting the road once more. Most of my rest was uneventful, save for some rustling that I heard from the outside. It was nice to be rested once more. Hitting the road again. Sorry, boss. C didn't respond, which I didn't mind much. It was better to be scolded a bit later. However... I realized quite quickly that something was wrong. I caught myself zoning out again and again, driving past others faster than before. At some point, I drove for a solid hour without really taking in anything around me. I realized something was off when I saw the billowing smoke gathering in the sky above me. The sound of sirens was next. Police cars. There were five of them lined up behind me. What the... how did this happen? I knew I could blank out while driving, but this had never happened before. I... I felt as if I lost my connection to my body for a second. As if I were there, but unseen. It feels good, right? A low, raspy voice purred in my ear. I looked around again, hoping that there was someone in the car with me. That I wasn't just hallucinating. But I was on my own. No matter what you do, don't listen to him! Okay, Jared. Maybe... maybe you need more sleep than you thought you did. Yeah, that's it. Just stop the car, talk to the cops, and everything will be fine. Drive! I hit the gas harder than I ever had before, a shriek falling from my lips as I did so. I... wasn't in control. But I still felt bad. I didn't know why. Or maybe I did. I felt... confused. All I knew was that my car was a lot more beaten up than before. My wheels were covered in what looked like red paint. Because there was no way it was something else, right? Yeah, that's the best way to explain. Confused and lost, trying to lift my leg off the pedals. But I was unable to do so. Jared White, you are under arrest for causing a mass accident. Please stop your car and... Voices echoed in my head. But all I could do was keep my hands on the steering wheel. I tried to shake it off. I tried to regain control, but there was no way for me to do so. That's it. I'm almost free. I saw it for the second time. Its face stretched, eyes large, wide, grinning at me in the rearview mirror as if it was just a friend, a passenger of mine. And then, then I saw the cliff coming. I tried to steer back onto the road, but it wouldn't let me. My only chance was opening the door and jumping out which at the speed my truck was going felt dangerous. And yet, 
I knew what I had to do, but I didn't have time. I saw the people chasing me, their eyes wide in panic as my beloved truck hit the barrier. And then it all went black. I woke up in the hospital. I was fine. But the people it had hurt weren't, and I would live with that guilt forever. 